Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I beg to move that the second stage of the Abortion Services Safe Access Zones Bill be agreed. Thank you. And the second stage of the Abortion Services Safe Access Zones Bill has been moved. In accordance with the Convention, the Business Committee has not allocated any time limits on this debate. And I call Ms Bailey to open the debate on the Bill. Ms Bailey. Thank you. I suppose, firstly, I want to reassure all members, if possible, um, that this bill is by no means a rushed response to what we are seeing as the escalation of protests um, across hospitals, clinics and family planning centres across Northern Ireland. This comes in a response to what I witnessed and what I experienced during my time as a volunteer with the Mary Stopes Clinic in Belfast City Centre. And what I learned during that time was that this was not protest, certainly not protest as I understand it. What is happening on our streets is a very deliberate campaign of harassment and intimidation against women. During my time spent there, I was spat at, I was assaulted, I had holy water splashed on me, I was verbally abused. I had one young woman who was so distressed that she ran into four lanes of oncoming traffic to try and escape the protesters. I had another young woman alone in the city um, being filmed and threatened to be uploaded and broadcast on social media. They threatened to report the scenes to the police. And it causes such distress to people and the unintended consequences of these protests to other building users, to other premises users, staff, clients, and anybody else trying to access. Every woman of childbearing age is targeted. Staff don't feel that they can carry out their duties safely. They're also recorded and threatened and intimidate, intimidated. We're hearing now from Health and Social Care Trust staff um, that they have now had to employ extra security personnel, that they have had to put reinforced windows in premises, that they've had to use blackouts on glass, that they've had to install CCTV cameras. So I've been working to produce this bill since first being elected back in 2016, and I'm glad to have it debated today in this House. Now, I'm also very well aware that there are many different views in this House on reproductive rights and abortion specifically. But what I ask is that members do not distract themselves with their views on that and focus on what this bill seeks to achieve, and that is simply safe access to health care provision for all people and all staff. What it does not seek to do is to remove anyone's right to protest, and nor would I ever support such attempts under any circumstances. This bill has been drafted with a very heavy focus on achieving a balance between competing rights and freedoms. The freedom of thought, conscience and religion under Article 9, and the freedom of assembly and association under Article 11 both of which are provided with limitations. Those limitations are stipulated as no restriction shall be placed on the exercise of these rights other than such as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society in the interest of national security or public safety for the prevention of disorder or crime for the protection of health or morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. I feel that this bill achieves that balance. Now, this bill, and I go into a brief overview of the sections and hope that members have had time to read this. But in section one, it simply sets out the overview and that requires the Department of Health to establish safe access zones. 
criminalising acts within the zone which prevent or impede access or influence, harass, alarm, distress those accessing the premises. And section 2 stipulates the premises where abortions are carried out and sets the definition of a protected premise. Any premises where terminations are or are proposed to be legally carried out. And section 3 is about premises where information, advice or counselling is provided. And that includes such premises within definition of a protected premise under three conditions. The premise is a hospital, health and social care trust clinic used to provide medical services under the health and personal social care NI order 1972 or approved by Department of Health for the purposes of this section. Premises that provide information, advice or counselling on abortion. And the operator of premise, premises requested it by, and the, de the Department of Health determines it to be a protected premises. And only the, de the Department of Health can make that de determination if it is reasonable to do so. Section 4 looks at protected persons. And that stipulates anyone attending a protected premises to access treatment, information, advice or counselling. Anyone accompanying them or anyone working in or providing services to the premises. Section 5 looks at the safe access zone and that extends to the premises, all entrances and exits and the public area outside and in the immediate vicinity as designated by the Department of Health. And what that's designed to do is to allow protected people to carry out their duties or to access services safely without fear, without intimidation and with the assurance of confidentiality. Section 6 goes into the offences and that makes it an offence within the safe access zone to influence a protected person or prevent and impede their access or cause them harassment, alarm or distress. Stipulates that recording a protected person without their consent for the same purpose is also an offence. It also creates a defence if a person didn't know or had no reasonable way of knowing that the protected person was in a safe access zone. Would the Certainly. Could the member explain why Clause 6 is at all necessary, given that under the uh, legislation as presently exists, most notably the Protection from Harassment Order of 1997, harassment is already a criminal offence, and under the Public Order Order of 1987, disorderliness and all that goes with it is already a criminal offence. So where is the necessity to duplicate within this uh, bill? Thank the member for the intervention. Um, and again, in my experience, the current harassment laws are simply not suffice. Under current harassment laws, we have to have the same person targeting the same person on two or more occasions and for that person then to report to the police. So in my experience, anybody accessing services in particular won't report to the police. They want to maintain their confidentiality and the police struggle to enforce current harassment laws. Then we also have another circumstance where um, a member of staff from Informing Choices, which was formerly the Family Planning Association, was assaulted. Um, and that conviction was upheld, but yet that person who assaulted that staff member is still allowed to protest at the doors, and the police feel that they can't take any action. Yeah. Surely under the harassment order, there is the capacity upon conviction, indeed it doesn't even require conviction, to have a restraining order. So that, that area is also covered uh, in respect of future activity. So I really struggle to understand why the member is bringing a bill to duplicate the law which already exists. 
like the member again for his intervention and go back to um, under current law. I don't feel that it is um, able to tackle what is happening. In my own personal experience, on one occasion when I was assaulted, uh, reported to the police, the person was arrested, was um, investigated uh, and was after six weeks of having a restraining order um, and a zone put on them. Um, no further action was deemed to be taken because no sufficient CCTV evidence was able to be collected and therefore that person was allowed to continue with the behaviours. So listening to the police in discussion with the police um, over the years of my experience, um, the current harassment order is simply not suffice to do and allow people that confidentiality and that safe access to premises. Certainly, yep. Thank the member for, for giving way. And further to Mr. Allister's intervention, um, could, could the member explain why she has not gone down the approach of strengthening the current harassment laws and harassment order that is in existence that, that you have claimed uh, is below standard in terms of what would be required rather than going down the approach of a private member's bill? Thank the member for that. Um, my experience, I feel that this is needed for specific reasons that I hope that I've already set out and that we're seeing the escalation and the targeted campaign against women on the streets of Northern Ireland. So that's the reason that I have brought this bill, certainly. Would the member agree with me, and, and I can state this categorically, having sat on both the Justice Committee and be previously and currently on the Policing Board, that the current ha harassment laws do not um, suffice and restraining orders are all well and good to talk about but if you want to speak to people about why we needed a domestic abuse bill restraining orders was part of the reason because they certainly did not pr protect women and families from domestic abuse of any description and just to make that point if, if you do if you are successful in getting a restraining order very quickly you will find that person can have you back in court and there is a cost to that. So I think that it is important that we have laws that actually protect people, not what looks good on paper. I thank the member for her intervention, and you're absolutely right. So with harassment orders um, and reporting to the police, this all takes time as well. And when people are trying to access health care or counselling or advice in uh, emergency circumstances, it's just simply not plausible that they can go down that that avenue. Oh, sorry. Certainly. Sorry. I, just don't, I, I'm much I just don't understand the distinction the member is making. Any criminal offence, the proof thereof takes time. There has to be a complaint, there has to be an investigation, there has to be a prosecution. Now, whether that prosecution arises under your clause 6 or under the harassment order, it's not going to be any quicker. So, so there really is nothing in the point that the member is making about we need to uh, get more instant uh, remedy. The law is still the law. It still has to take its course. You can't short circuit it. Thank the member for that. And again, I'll go back to if someone is trying to access health care and they're prevented or fearful or intimidated from doing so, they're not, they're not reporting to the police. What they're doing is leaving the area and not accessing the health care. So this is about creating a safe zone where people can access that health care, where they don't have to necessarily report to the police and go through that whole process. It's health care, it's access and services that are provided in a number of places throughout Northern Ireland and to then expect women who should be able to access this confidentiality as it's nobody else's business what health care people do need access to and um, to be reporting to the police and go through that is completely untenable so i want to turn to section seven and that is the enforcement provisions the enforcement in this bill allow for the, the psni to direct or remove a person from a safe access zone if they believe um, or think that they are about to commit an offence under section 62 of this bill and can direct them to cease recording under section 63 of this bill and may use reasonable force to remove them if necessary. 
It also makes it an offence not to comply or resist removal, and that's punishable on summary conviction by fine not exceeding level four on the standard scale. Section 8 sets out the procedure for designating a safe access zone, and that stipulates that the op operator of a premises notifies the Department of Health that it wishes to have a safe access zone. The Department of Health then has eight weeks in which to do so. The Department must consult with the operator, the surrounding landowners, occupiers, PSNI, other appropriate people to determine the extent of a safe zone. And the Department can vary it after consultation, remove it if the operator no longer wishes it to be there, and must publish extent of the zone and any variations, revocations as it thinks appropriate. Section 9 is the exercise of functions, and the Department must have regard to safety and dignity of protected persons, their right to private and family life under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and the right to manifest religious belief, freedom of assembly and expression, and right to protest, as I have already mentioned, under Articles 9 and 11. Section 10 is the monitoring, so it calls for the Department to publish annual reports on the effectiveness of the zone and protecting safety and dignity of protected persons. Section 11 is just a brief interpretation. Section 12 is a commencement, and Section 6 and 7 come into operation three months after royal assent, if this bill is enacted, and everything else on the day after royal assent. And Section 13 is simply the short title of the bill. So, members, as I say, I do feel that this bill achieves this balance. Um, and, Speaker, if I could add anything else, it would be just again to, re to reiterate that all people, every single citizen, has the right to access health care without fear, without intimidation and in confidence, that staff have the right to do their job without abuse or harassment, and that we would not accept this in any other circumstance. We would not accept this outside blood donation centres, and therefore it should not be acceptable in this context. The 2018 report of the inquiry concerning the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland under Article 8 of the Optional Protocol to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women concluded that women and girls in Northern Ireland have experienced grave and systemic violations of their rights as a result of restricted access to abortion. Among the specific articles of the Convention found to be violated were Article 10 and Article 12 for failing to protect women from harassment by anti-abortion protesters when seeking sexual and reproductive health care services and information. The inquiry report referred to the impunity of anti-abortion protesters for assaults perpetrated against women seeking abortions. I have consulted and met widely with many bodies during the, the drafting of this bill and to date there has been no human rights or equality impacts that have um, been raised. In fact, the Equality Commission themselves have welcomed the bill in terms of providing further clarity and uh, receiving it as both the opportunity for the bill to have a positive equality impact, which I think is something worth noting. The Northern Ireland Office did not move to introduce safe access zones or any measures when they changed abortion laws via Westminster back in October 2019. They said that they would keep an eye on the ongoing situation. 
I have met with the Secretary of State on this issue and he welcomes the move to follow through and finish what was not done back then. So I urge this House to please step up and today support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Chairperson of the Health Committee, Colm Gildernew. Um, I welcome the opportunity Corley, to make some initial remarks on behalf of the Health Committee, outlining the Committee's consideration of the Bill before speaking as my party's Health Spokesperson. As the Member has outlined, it, this is a relatively short Bill of 13 clauses that requires the Department to establish safe access zones around abortion clinics in order to protect the women who use those clinics and those staff who work in those clinics and indeed in other health care uh, services that are delivered in, those, in that area. The Bill makes it a criminal offence to harass people in a safe access zone around the clinics. During the Committee's consideration of the Severe Fetal Impairment Amendment Abortion Bill, we took evidence from the Trusts and the issue of protests were raised by the Chief Executives of the Trusts who highlighted their concerns for service users and for staff. I will return to this a bit later. The Bill has a number of policy objectives, including to ensure women and others visiting or working in premises are not approached in an unsolicited manner and prevents activities designed to cause distress or to deter a person from approaching the building. It places obligations on the Department of Health to create safe access zones, to designate the extent of the zone, to consult on the zone and publish an annual report highlighting the effectiveness of the safe access zones and creates a series of obligations on constables in relation to the monitoring and enforcing of safe access zones. So in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, during our consideration of the SFIA bill, the issue came up during the committee's evidence uh, a number of times. A number of those who submitted evidence highlighted the difficulties for women in accessing health care services. At our meeting on the 8th of July, the committee discussed this issue with the chief executives of the trusts. The committee was concerned by the evidence that it heard from the chief executives on the number of reports that had been made to the PSNI and on the use of trust resources to improve security at trust premises. Following the briefing, the committee wrote to the Department of Health, the Department of Justice, PSNI and the trusts to ask what measures were being taken to address the issue. In its correspondence, the committee did recognise the right to lawful and peaceful protest but highlighted concerns that patients and staff may feel intimidated or harassed. In responding to that letter, the Minister of Health indicated his willingness to work with the Minister for Justice on this cross-cutting issue. The Minister also indicated that the development of a service specification model for the commissioning of abortion services was underway and that this work would take account of the need to, to provide these services in a way that, that protects patients and staff from obstruction or intimidation. The Minister of Justice indicated her willingness to bring forward legislative proposals to provide for exclusion zones, but advised that it was not likely to be progressed in this mandate. The Trusts provided information on protests and the actions that each Trust was taking to mitigate the impact on staff and patient at premises in which non-commissioned early medical abortion services were being provided. And finally, the PSNI reported engagement with Trust staff and with those engaged in, pro in protests. The Committee will Corley, publish all of its correspondence on this issue alongside its report on the Severe Fetal Impairment Amendment Abortion Bill. In relation to the committee briefing then, the committee was briefed by the member on the principles of the bill at its meeting last Thursday. The member provided the committee with an overview of the need for the bill and the consultation undertaken. The member also provided her personal experiences of being a client escort with the Murray Stopes Centre. Members asked a number of questions during the briefing, including in relation to definitions of harassment and the need for further training for police to deal with these situations. There was a discussion in relation to possible challenges of the legislation and the likelihood of a number of challenges being brought forward in relation to the safe access zones and the possible differences in interpretations by all those involved. The member outlined that there was a legal challenge taken forward in England in relation to safe access zones. 
Ms Bailey advised the committee that the case was not successful and an appeal was lodged in the Supreme Court which decided not to allow that challenge and upheld the original decision. Ms Bailey also outlined that there could be some costs following the implementation of this bill. She outlined that comparable costs in Britain were approximately £250,000 per year, which was largely in relation to legal costs challenging, uh, contesting challenges. Members raised other issues during the briefing and provided the bill pass a second stage. The committee looks forward to engaging with stakeholders and scrutinising the bill in further detail. I'd now like to make a few remarks as a Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. Um, and firstly, I want to, to thank Claire and acknowledge the experience that she has firsthand in relation to this difficult issue, an issue that we have all members seen playing out in front of our very own eyes. So I think we need to recognise that there is an issue here and that we therefore have a responsibility to uh, engage and, and see how that might be moved forward. Uh, the right to protest, members, and the right to free speech are rights and values that I endorse. The human right to access health care is also a right that I endorse, and I support this right for every patient in every circumstance. The right to go to work safely without fear of intimidation is another right that I endorse and is the entitlement of every worker, and I would hope uh, 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 agreed by members of this House. The protests we have seen at clinics in recent months infringe upon the rights of others, of patients seeking health care and workers trying to provide that care in a compassionate way. The protests are not always what anyone would describe as respectful. They are sometimes frightening, they are sometimes intimidatory, targeting vulnerable patients who are simply exercising their human right to access the health care they need and are entitled to. I will, yes. Thank you. Thank the member for taking the intervention. Would the member agree with me that first and foremost what needs to be recognised by this House, because this is where leadership comes from, that this is a health care issue and if we talk in language that does not recognise that then we allow for this behaviour. We allow for people to say it's not a health care issue. We need to give leadership within this House. Thank the member for intervention and I do agree that, that it is certainly a health care issue and we need to um, ensure that health care can be accessed and provided in a way that's free from intimidation. We have heard members that these protests are impacting people who are dealing with really tough situations involving at times the loss of a much-wanted baby, difficult decisions in difficult circumstances, and indeed even at times those who are struggling to carry a difficult pregnancy to term, despite knowing the result may be the loss of their child at or soon after birth. They are causing stress across trusts too, with services having to be secured and sometimes moved from one site to another, causing additional expense and additional burden on trust staff who are already hard pressed. It's regrettable to me that we have to find a way to secure a patient's access to a health care procedure they might need. So too is the idea that workers are being harassed or intimidated going to their place of work in the course of which they are providing health care to all. In often delicate and sensitive times in the lives of some women, they are being confronted by protests that use inflammatory and offensive imagery to traumatise and often re-traumatise and trigger patients. I support this bill, members, and what it aims to do. It proposes to provide safe passage to workers and patients, whilst also recognising the rights of others to free speech and the right to assemble and protest. Thank you, and I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whilst this House is deeply divided on the issue of abortion, we can all stand four square behind the need to tackle abuse against those entering health and social care premises. I want to make that very clear from the outset. Neither I nor my party support abuse or harassment. Therefore, the question facing us today is not whether we choose to address this form of wrongdoing, but rather how we choose to address it. With that said, I am concerned that this bill would represent a missed opportunity to crack down on specific and prevalent forms of threatening and abusive behaviour at these sites. Either by design or neglect, Mr. Speaker, the criminal offences outlined in Clause 6, as Mr Alistair alluded to in his intervention, 
are both vague and open-ended. The general offence would extend to any action deemed likely to directly or indirectly influence someone's decisions. Anything from a conversation to a leaflet under this bill would be deemed criminal. Notwithstanding whether such a definition would be enforceable in practice, this is an incredibly broad scope by any means. I mean, even when we look at this particular bill, some members will deem those that hold a pro-life stance as offensive, and others like me can consider a pro-abortion stance as equally offensive. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, the then United Kingdom Home Secretary Savage Javid conducted as an in-depth review about protest activities outside abortion clinics. The outcome was clear. He acknowledged that, and I quote, introducing national buffer zones would not be a proportionate response. Further in the report, the Home Secretary went on to describe the overwhelming type of activity that took place at such protests, and I again quote, the main activities that were reported to us that take place during protest include praying, displaying banners, handing out leaflets. There were relatively few reports of more aggressive activities. And whilst again I make clear, neither I nor my party nor the vast majority of pro-life advocates have any common cause with those who engage in either aggressive, I will in a moment, either aggressive or violent activities. They should be pursued with the full rigour of the law. On that point, I will give way to the Chair. Well, I thank the member for giving way. Would the member acknowledge that while he references very few protests that cause concern, the impact on each and every one of those individuals who is caught up in those very few is substantial and perhaps life-changing? I thank the member for his intervention, and absolutely, I, I understand and appreciate that anybody in any circumstance, uh, if confronted, whether it be on an issue which is personal uh, to them or personal to somebody else, can be a distressing circumstance. And that's why I fundamentally believe that if we are to address such harassment and we are to address such intimidating actions, we must use the proper legislative means and vehicle to ensure that we can weed out those instances in which the report highlighted were very few, but all being concerning at the, at the same time. I will indeed, Mr Allister. Does this bill, not, in fact, not do the very opposite? Uh, instead of weeding out the sinister, that which needs to be dealt with, it equates the very basic issue of lobbying and influencing with the more sinister. Because in Clause 6.2, it lists influencing is now to be a criminal offence. We are going to criminalise the attempt to influence people, no matter how mildly, meekly, lawfully, orderly that is done. Is that not the real pernicious inroad of this clause? Thank Mr. Allister for his intervention, and it is precisely for, for those reasons and the, the open-ended and vague nature of the bill which causes me and indeed my party concern as to where potentially this could go to. And I will touch on those points further in my contribution. Though I do believe there are more appropriate avenues to pursue, such as the strengthening of harassment laws or other legislation surrounding harassment to deal appropriately with such matters rather than the pursuit of a private member's bill of this nature. There is a real risk, members, that the clauses which constitute the main fabric of the bill would unfairly restrict freedom of assembly, expression and religious belief as set out in Articles 9, 10 and 11 of the European Convention of Human Rights. It also risks setting a precedent 
a precedent for banning protected speech in other public settings. Whether intended or unintended, this bill will have consequences. I, I will in a moment. I just want to proceed it at this stage, please. Members, everyone has a right to free speech within the law, a right which we should never take for granted, and a right which must always be protected. There are many members in this House who say things I do not agree with, and I am sure they could say the same about me. In fact, some in which I have allowed to intervene in the debate today. We will have differences of opinion, but we must always protect the legitimate right for you to express that opinion. On that point, I will give way to Mr Carroll. I thank the member for giving way. I would accept there is no ultimate freedom of speech, and with every uh, element of freedom of speech comes rights and responsibility. You can't just go out and offend uh, certain organisations, minority groups in our society. And would he also recognise that with this bill, uh, there is only a limit on the right to give out certain material in a certain area, um, offensive images that me and many other people find or some anti-choice organisations will still be allowed to display to be displayed in our towns and cities across the north. Would he accept that point uh, with this bill if it proceeds? I thank the member for his intervention. And it's almost as if he's had prior sight of my speech because I am coming on to that particular point about the responsibilities. But in relation to the offensive nature, as he would deem, of the pro-life position and what they're, what they're arguing for, I would say this, that the member has to equally realise that there are many people in our society from a pro-life perspective whom are deeply offended at the termination of the unborn, and therefore they feel so passionate that it is their duty to stand up for the unborn, whether it be in democratic settings like this, but also from our community's perspective as well. But in relation to the point that the member has raised in terms of rights and responsibility, of course, free speech is not an absolute. There are limitations prohibiting speech that incites violence or constitutes harassment or is defamatory, but there are laws to deal with that, which should be any member's first port of call, rather than a bill of this nature, which would, in my mind, have dangerous and far-reaching consequences. On a practical level, Mr. Speaker, there is a risk that establishing buffer zones may only have the effect of displacing public order concerns away from the immediate vicinity of public or private premises to other access points of key uh, junctions. What then? Further, this bill is unlikely to ease operational pressures facing the PSNI as a result of any protest activity. Instead, in all likelihood, it would create further training requirements associated with new offences. Experiences from other jurisdictions indicate that the bills I, I will in a, in a moment. Experiences from other jurisdictions indicate that the bill's arrangements are likely to be wrapped up in litigation from free speech activists for many years to come. This would place an extra strain on the public purse and would be a key consideration as the Department of Health aimed to chart a course towards recovery and reform. On that point, I will give way to Ms. Dunn. The member for taking the intervention. I'm not aware of the PSNI raising any concerns about any training that they would have to take in relation to this legislation, but if I'm wrong on that, I'm sure that the proposer of the bill can, can highlight that. And I'm, I'm also a wee bit confused. Are you seriously suggesting that in any other circumstance where individuals needed to access health care, whether it be cancer services, IVF services, whatever that would be, that we would be having this same conversation, because I do not believe for one second that we would. I thank the member for intervention, and I think the bill sponsor may come on to that point, but I am not aware of any PSNI representations in relation to the bill. In fact, I think that the, the original consultation for the bill actually goes back to 2016. Uh, I am not aware if there is anything more recent than that, but I am sure the bill sponsor can come on to that. Uh, and, uh, in relation to the member's second point, I would say this, Mr. Speaker, please don't misrepresent what I'm saying here today. We have to realise that this bill in itself has potential far-reaching consequences for fundamental freedoms and values. It's not about 
pitting one section against another, whether that be access to cancer services or other such hospital services, or indeed other settings. Because uh, I think in times past we have seen some very dangerous forms of protest outside PSNI recruitment centres, where dissident Republicans have threatened uh, those new PSNI recruits or potential recruits with threats of death. So I think we have to, to get back to the bill and, and what its potential far-reaching consequences are, rather than trying to draw. Now, I, I, I won't at this stage. I have given way quite generously. Uh, what, rather than get to a stage where we're trying to pit one section against another, the content of the bill is what I'm interested in, and the content in which I deem and see as fundamentally flawed. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves whether the objective of affording patients and staff appropriate protection would be better served not by writing a blank check, not by introducing, in my view, a regressive bill limiting and restricting hard-fought basic freedoms and values as old as time, but rather by enhancing existing tools, including the law on harassment. Such an approach would have an established foundation and would not require either the extensive lead-in time or the cost that the bill uh, arrangements would incur, or indeed, as was highlighted by Mr Alistair, run the risk of duplication. In a statement and in closing, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, or Mr Speaker, in a statement to the BBC NI prior to this debate, Minister Strawn stated that it is for the Northern Ireland Assembly to determine whether the proposals set out in this bill will provide an effective means for protecting those rights alongside the rights uh, to freedom of assembly and expression. The Health Minister is indeed, of course, right in this regard. And as for me and my party, we respectfully say that we do not feel that these proposals set out in this bill are the most effective means to deal with harassment. And for those reasons, Mr Speaker, we will vote against today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I call Cara Hunter. Cara Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I welcome the opportunity today to speak on this bill uh, as our party's health spokesperson and as uh, the SDLP MLA for East Derry. I would personally like to thank Ms. Bailey uh, for bringing this important bill forward. And recently, we have seen the rise of the much needed discussion on the harm, intimidation, and violence against women in our society. I feel that this bill before us today addresses a real part of that issue here in Northern Ireland and the worrying normalisation of harassment towards women seeking medical treatment. Let's be clear, no form of intimidation, harassment and violence has been or ever will be acceptable. On the topic of where these protests are happening, many are places that offer family planning, counselling, for those who have suffered miscarriages and a host of other services as well as terminations. I feel this behaviour of protesters can be divided into two groups. The first uh, includes displaying banners and handing out leaflets, but the second, in some cases, protest activities can be seen handing out model fetuses, displaying graphic images, following people, blogging their path and, as Ms Bailey had alluded to earlier, even assaulting them. One cannot begin to imagine the damaging, detrimental impact this behaviour has had on patients, on staff, on women who have just had a miscarriage are now being forced to look at these images. This behaviour can leave patients distressed and has caused some to rebook their appointments, causing further delay and not to follow medical advice in order to avoid these protesters. I recognise fully that all anti-abortion activities outside these clinics can cause great distress and I would like to extend my sympathies to those who are either going through or who have previously gone through this extremely difficult and personal process. I hope members will agree with me today that women have fundamental right to privacy, to dignity, especially so when they are visiting a hospital profoundly vulnerable and at a very sensitive time. And let's be clear, this isn't always women having a termination. It's often any woman of childbearing age entering clinics. I am aware some see this argument as complex or reject this bill to, due to the nature of competing constitutional rights. But let's be clear, we respect the right to religious belief. We respect the right to assembly. We do. We accept the right to protest. Yep. 
Member for Given Way, would the member agree with me that there's nothing Christian or religious in um, shouting abuse at other women or calling them murders when you don't know their circumstances or what they've been through? I'd like to thank the, the member for her intervention. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think when we look back to the 1980s, uh, with the AIDS pandemic, for example, uh, many people would be outside AIDS clinics uh, protesting, saying it was, quote, a gay disease. Uh, and that shows uh, just the level of disgust that I have towards this attitude um, outside these clinics. These are people, uh, vulnerable individuals, attending these clinics to seek health care and to seek support. And they deserve every right to dignity and privacy when doing so. So I'd like to thank the member for her important intervention. This is not about criminalising prayer. Uh, it is about preventing harm and promoting the safety and well-being of women trying to access healthcare and the SDLP support this bill today. Thank you. And I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I think it's important uh, to separate this proposed legislation uh, and the debate on it uh, from our personal position on pro-life or pro-choice in relation to abortion. There should be no connection made, either spoken or implied. The protests outside either trust or charitable premises has been going on for some considerable time. And just over recent weekends, we have seen this type of protest been copied outside COVID vaccination hubs in a part of West Belfast. No matter what the protest issue is about, such behaviour cannot be condoned. In considering this legislation, we must balance uh, campaign rights. People do have a right to hold a view strongly enough that they will stand on a picket line or carry placards or write irate letters to public representatives or the media. But people who are seeking medical advice or guidance are equally entitled to do so in an atmosphere that is not frightening or intimidating, especially when those people may be at the lowest and most vulnerable point in their lives. Now, the bill requires the Department of Health to establish uh, safe access zones around abortion clinics in order to protect the women using these clinics. It would become a criminal offence to harass people in a safe access area around these clinics. I am pleased that the, the bill has not been definitive in uh, the scope of these safe access areas because Obviously, different locations will have different requirements, and I think that it's good that the department will be able to call on the advice of, of people in those locations who will be best judged, uh, best able to judge the extent of, of creating uh, these safe access areas. And no one should be obstructed or intimidated from accessing lawful health care services for whatever reason, including the staff who work at such facilities. And other behaviours that the bill wants to prohibit is filming and recording people, which again uh, my party would support. And we also can't lose sight of the fact that some of these buildings uh, where these clinics are conducted also house other businesses, offices, industries. And staff in those uh, offices um, who may have suffered the loss of a baby through a stillbirth, for instance, still has to run the gauntlet of the placards, and the pamphlets, the protests, the shouting, and whatever. Uh, and we can't, we can't forget that. In all conscience, that can't be right, and we can't allow that. In addition, whilst the right to assemble and express an opinion is an important freedom, it does need to be balanced with causing undue distress and disruption to any user of any service. This bill isn't about stopping freedom of speech. It's about stopping the practice in albeit limited situations of women being impeded or openly confronted when accessing such facilities. The legislation will not stop people protesting. It will simply determine where they can carry out those protests. If a group or an individual feel moved 
to conduct a protest in Belfast city centre or the centre of any of our towns around Northern Ireland, they will be perfectly entitled to do so as long as they're lawful and they're peaceful. The, I think that uh, the police uh, currently do have a difficulty in dealing with these protests. I, seen, I think we've seen, we've seen that and we've said that the, the laws at the moment uh, are, are, are difficult for the police to maybe to interpret and, and, and to act on. Uh, I think that the, these safe access areas will provide police with absolute clarity uh, as to where they can intervene. And we, uh, we therefore especially welcome the proposal within the, the private members bill that proposes to allow PSNI officers to direct a person to leave a place or to remove a person from a place rather than prosecute. The Ulster Unionist Party do reserve the right to uh, bring amendments uh, to this bill as it processes, but we certainly support the general thrust of the bill. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the principles of this bill today, and I would thank the proposer, Ms. Bailey, for not only bringing it, for, but for her resilience in pursuing this legislative change over many years. Safe access zones exist in the, wor in, um, in the words of Queensland Law Reform Commission to protect the safety and well-being and respect the privacy and dignity of people accessing health services, whatever services those may be. Mr Speaker, one of the arguments raised against this bill is that safe access zones have generally not been put in place, at least not in legislation elsewhere. In common law jurisdictions, um, they, have, they are not unknown. However, they do exist in large parts of Australia and Canada and in some parts of the United States. Although the Irish Government appears to have reversed its initial plans to prioritise them in forthcoming legislation, and they have not yet been pursued in other parts of the UK, there is legislation enabling them in the Isle of Man. For me, the fact that Northern Ireland would be the first jurisdiction in the UK to legislate in this way speaks in favour of the Bill because being at the vanguard of legislation which is about safety, well-being, privacy and dignity is exactly what this Assembly should be about. Nevertheless, going first in the UK does, not, does also speak to the complexity of the issue and it is the prioritisation of human dignity and the balance of human rights on which I wish to focus my remarks. Firstly, to be clear, my reading of the Bill is that it would be an offence to harass people within the safe access zones. That does, to be clear, mean protection for all and any people involved, not just those seeking directly to access health services, although they are the obvious victims of harassment currently, but also those who work in them, and for that matter, those who are accompanying anyone accessing the services. And as has already been highlighted here today, we on the Health Committee have heard from the Chief Executives of the Trust about how damaging this is for the morale of the staff working in those settings. Here, and I will come back to this, I do think that the Department of Health is already obliged to consider protecting the people attending the healthcare sites, and I do think that the um, Justice Minister stands ready to support him in that. Um, secondly, the issue fundamentally is an unsolicited approach, and particularly activity designed to cause distress to people accessing sexual and reproductive health services, and thus the assurance of their safety well-being, privacy and dignity. Again, to be clear, we are talking about access to any sexual and reproductive health services, including counselling. I think the description of the, of the zones themselves is self-explanatory. Notably, the ability for the Department to set up zones is similar to the law adopted in the Isle of Man in 2019, and I wish to emphasise why it is so important to protect the dignity of those accessing health services. Although the proposer does not identify any equality impact, in fact, I think there is a positive equality impact inherent in the bill. The huge majority of people protected by this legislation will be women, specifically, proportionately, often women in crisis at a time of vulnerability. In other words, for me, the bill serves to, to try to correct an existing inequality. 
Dignity is part of this. It is a word which has come to be used in recognition that we all have a fundamental right to dignity. Let us not understate how far protesters can go, in some instances, to, fight, to act in defiance of that right. The verbal abuse alone is vicious and thoroughly undignified. Calling women whores or fallen women, particularly at such an evidently vulnerable time, is already beyond what any reasonable person would see as a dignified protest. Shouting targeted directly at women in particular, often through loudspeakers, is already beyond what any reasonable person would see as dignified protest. Physically blocking a footpath so as to deny women their right to pass is already beyond what any reasonable person would see as dignified protest. Such protests are designed to make women feel unsafe, to have no regard for their well-being, to deny their privacy and to do anything but maintain dignity. Yes, certainly. Has the member ever read Clause 9 of the Public Order, Order 1987? A person who uses threatening, abusive or insulting words or behaviour or displays any written material which is threatening, abusive or insulting is guilty of an offence. The law is already there. Well, I think that in this case we are strengthening the law and giving it particular relevance to this particular circumstance. Far from dignified women report feeling angry, uncomfortable, traumatised, scared, intimidated, upset, inadequate, unsettled and a raft of other emotions which are, are not just experienced at the time but which can have a lasting impact on mental well-being. We have spoken in this chamber many times about the need to protect our citizens' well-being. Such protests, in other words, are specifically designed not to make a, a point but to cause harm. When people are accessing health care, they should not have to run a gauntlet of hate and harm, for that is what is happening. I hope it is clear for everyone in this chamber, regardless of their opinion on abortion, that there can be no moral defence for a gauntlet of hate and harm. There is no justification for enabling it, no justification for participating in it, and no justification for us in this chamber to allow it to continue to happen. Reason well, certainly. I thank the member for giving way, but would she accept that those that in principle disagree with this bill are not suggesting uh, that the, these crimes in which the member has outlined are wrong, but rather there is alternative means by which uh, the law can be applied, as has already been highlighted by Mr Allister, and indeed strengthened upon? Thank you. And, and I've, as you mentioned, I have responded to Mr Allister there. Um, but I, I think that this is about the zones. This is not about denying people the right to protest, but it is within uh, 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 the, what we are trying to do is protect the space in which women and those accompanying them have to travel. Um, reasonable protest um, is about intentionally trying to steal someone's dignity. Mr. Speak Mr Deputy Speaker, the torrent of verbal abuse and the physical blockage of access is one thing, but another frequently report reported as causing distress. In fact, not is not just to those accessing health care, but also often those who are just passers-by. And that is... Um, the ex, um, display of graphic imagery. Um, as with the abuse and the blockage, this is designed specifically to cause harm and to steal dignity. It does not constitute a protest. It constitutes a direct attack on the dignity, on the privacy and on the well-being of the individual. But in fact, it is harmful even beyond that. It is harmful to the general public. And this is baby loss week. We, we know that there are a lot of women very much who are focusing on their own experience of miscarriage, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and we know that this um, imagery um, causes them great distress and offence. Although the bill does deal with photography as part of the offence, it does not deal with this graphic imagery, as this is so central to the distress and harm cause. This is something we will have to look at, and I know that the proposer is happy for us to look at this at the Health Committee. Having established the importance of dignity and the need to change, uh, for change to ensure women accessing health care can maintain dignity at all times, I will turn now to rights. Again, some of the unease around safe access zones in other jurisdictions has come down to balance of rights. I understand that balance is never easy. That is why I would urge members to back the principles of the bill today but we, um, so we can look further at this issue when it comes before committee. But to be clear, however, setting up a gauntlet of hate and harm is not a right. 
The right to protest, like any other right, is not absolute. It comes with responsibility, and essentially that responsibility is to behave reasonably in this instance. No one can argue that intentionally targeting women to this abuse is behaving reasonably. So the right to protest has been to be considered and balanced in this um, context. There is therefore, um, of course, a fundamental right to live free from such abuse and intimidation and to human dignity. This should never um, be balanced off against the right to protest um, when, when such um, means are undertaken. Moving on, furthermore, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a right to access health care. Indeed, the first legislation for what we are considering here today was passed in British Columbia exactly on that premise. The law in New South Wales is also centred around this point. There will be some detail on the human rights aspects for the committee to, to work, as I have already indicated, perhaps most obviously around Clause 4 and who, is exactly, who exactly is protected by the Bill, but the principles are um, surely sound. So again, the principles of the Bill, the right to live free from intimidation, the fundamental right to dignity, the right to protest um, pr provided that it is carried out reasonably and within bre without breaching others' rights and indeed the right to access health care itself. And I would strongly um, urge support in this chamber today. So in closing, Mr Speaker, I would again like to um, thank Ms Bailey and Informing Choices and other and Alliance for Choice and others who have campaigned over many years for this bill today and it has my full support. Thank you. I call Emma Sheeran. I rise in support of the bill and I want to congratulate Claire Bailey for bringing it before the Assembly and also acknowledge the work of Alliance for Choice and Informing Choices and others who have campaigned on this issue. And I also want to at this point acknowledge my own party colleague, Senator Paul Gavin, who has worked along with other parties with the Together for Safety campaign in the 26 counties and is in the process of introducing a similar bill in that jurisdiction at this time. This bill is simple. It's about compassion and empathy. It's about supporting women, protecting their right to access health, and shielding people from abuse. Just last Tuesday, we had the recommendations from the Truth Recovery Panel emanating from the report into mother and baby institutions in the North, a phenomenon which will forever remain one of the darkest stains in Irish history and a stark reminder of how not to treat women, girls and children. And the fact is that the abuse that people are subjected to outside clinics whilst accessing health care that they are entitled to is another element of the same misogyny and judgment that brought us those so-called homes. The same ignorance and stigma that sent women to England for decades. That is still sending women to England. What is it about other people's pregnancies that offers such fascination to so many? What is it that compels people to stand outside a health clinic and intimidate women whose stories they'll never know or understand? Sinn Féin is a party of protest. We support the fundamental right to protest and recognise that people should be free to take to the streets and have their point heard. However, to dismiss or trivialise the harm caused by these groups or to justify their actions by describing them as protest is a huge disservice. Their campaigns amount to intimidation and bullying, directed at people in vulnerable positions without any concern for their well-being. This is Baby Loss Awareness Week, which is an opportunity for many to share stories that they've perhaps not spoken about before, or to maybe take some comfort in the knowledge that they are not alone in their experience of miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy or stillbirth, losses that impact everyone differently. It's said that one in four women will experience miscarriage throughout their lives, but it's still taboo, still not spoken about openly. Many of these women will live their lives without telling anyone, or will tell someone and have their experience dismissed by a heartless comparison or a minimising of their loss. They'll get a letter notifying them of their next scan appointment and have to ring a receptionist and explain that they don't need it anymore. Have to dodge questions from well-meaning but ignorant relatives at family gatherings about when they plan to start a family. They'll get up 
and get on with it, acting as if everything is fine, feeling silly for feeling sad and choking back tears at advertisements for nappies. To go through that and then be exposed to a giant poster of a fetus in the womb accompanied by a throng of people chanting slurs is cruelty. And that's for women who are safe in the knowledge that they would not or could not be criminalised, that there are no repercussions for them if seen accessing health care. These so-called protesters have no regard for people's personal circumstances or the struggles that they've faced when it comes to their reproductive journeys. They openly target and attempt to shame women who need abortions, which is reprehensible. And their lack of compassion is further demonstrated by the fact that they don't care who else is caught in the crossfire. You cannot claim to care for the unborn whilst at the same time harassing expectant mothers. Imagine the heartbreak these placards and loudspeakers cause to the women who've been told that they'll never conceive. The women who've suffered ectopic pregnancies. The women who've been there before, but they're pregnant again and they're just waiting for the telltale cramp, terrified that they're going to lose another life. The prospective fathers, who never got to live out their dreams of bedtime stories or walks in the park, worrying about their partner and the impact that a fertility battle is having. For children, walking to school or the shops or going into a clinic for a totally unrelated procedure. For teenagers accessing contraception for the first time, trying to be responsible but afraid of the consequences and unsure of themselves. And perhaps most of all, for all the women out there, our friends, our sisters, our cousins, our aunts, who need or have needed a termination. This abuse is directed at them, it seeks to vilify and demonise them, and it's wrong. I commend this bill to the House. Gorham Hagat. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As someone who believes every life should be valued and respected, I want to say unequivocally that there is no place in our society for harassment or threatening or abusive behaviour against any individual in accessing any health intervention or service. In particular, there is a need to ensure that those who are vulnerable, are in crisis or have suffered loss receive adequate protection under the law. Therefore, we have to consider what are the appropriate means to this end. On balance, I do not believe this bill is the right vehicle to secure the most robust protections from harassment or indeed, in some cases, criminal behaviour. I form this position for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is our view that the aim of punishing and deterring such behaviour on health and social care premises could be realised via existing mechanisms in a way that better defends the fundamental freedoms of assembly and expression. There should be an acknowledgement that a majority of local pro-life cam campaigners act within the law. Therefore, there needs to be a targeted and narrow focus on rooting out offending among the small number of individuals who engage in such vile, threatening or violent behaviour. This could, for example, include a tightening of the current law in harassment. The case for a catch-all ban on protest activity at assigned premises is further weakened by the level of ambiguity in the Bill. Clause 6 would establish a general offence against anyone intent on a influencing a protected person, whether directly or indirectly, preventing or impeding access by a protected person or causing harassment, alarm or distress to a protected person. There is no clarity in what is deemed to constitute direct or indirect influence or the definition of alarm or distress. The clause also places no requirement for offending to be threatening, abusive or violent. This is a threshold that is stipulated in another, other important pieces of legislation including in relation to met domestic abuse and coercive control. Would this set the bar too low for prosecutions? Moreover, is, if someone is prosecuted, are the conditions of Clause 6 clear enough to make the offence operable by the courts? 
There is also the threat that this model would set a precedent for an unfair restriction of fundamental freedoms in other situations. If, for instance, it would be deemed a criminal offence to influence a person via a pamphlet outside of premises where pregnancy advice is provided, would the next step be to ban the distribution of literature on any topic in any public place or private space based on the eddy that may cause alarm? The bill sponsor suggests this legislation respond to a narrow problem, but that is not simple. It is not black and white, and there is real risk of unintended consequences. Therefore, while I absolutely agree that there should be greater flexibility within the current criminal framework to crack down on threatening and abusive behaviour against anyone entering our health and social care premises, or indeed independent premises, we cannot take these issues in isolation. There should be an awareness that there are separate examples of unacceptable behaviour that need to be tackled. Upgrading the law on harassment would provide an opportunity to tackle all abuses in the round. It is for these reasons, unfortunately, I cannot support the bill at this stage. I call Orlea Flynn. Um, and I'm pleased to support the Safe Access Zone bill today um, as it promises to protect the rights of patients who are accessing vital health care, often in the most traumatic circumstances. Um, in recent months, it has been very distressing to hear from patients who are being obstructed and harassed as they go about what is a human right um, to access health care. Offensive images that are meant to cause hurt and distress are doing just that, and they're amounting to psychological and emotion, emotional abuse of patients. And in my opinion, this is no way to exercise your right to protest or to exercise your right to free speech, nor is it showing much respect to the rights of others, especially at such a vulnerable time in their lives. And while I support the right to free speech and the right to protest, I also support the notion that these rights are exercised with respect and care, and I know that that's actually been said across the House today, but unfortunately in some circumstances we know that that's, that's not always the case. And while those freedoms and rights around free speech are important, they do supersede the rights of patients to get the health care that they need. Um, sorry, they don't supersede the rights of patients to get the health care they need, and nor do they supersede the rights of workers to go to work safely and without distress. From recent health committee briefings, I know the committee chair touched on this, but we, we have learnt around um, that some of the services provided by clinics have now had to be moved because of some of the intimidatory nature of certain protests. And um, extra resources have also then um, had to be spent in relocating some of those healthcare facilities. And obviously, we know that the healthcare system, um, this is an expense that it can ill afford because it's already under immense pressure. But it's also important that the patients and the healthcare workers, regardless of funds or resources, that they can go about their business and their, their treatment safely. Um, the Health Committee has heard evidence of trusts having to secure buildings, and again, um, that's at an, an additional cost. And we've heard from health trusts of patients and workers that are being confronted by offensive and traumatising images and slurs. We've also heard of protesters that have been recording and taking pictures of patients and workers as they're entering and exiting the clinics. And these behaviours are nothing to do with rights or freedoms. Um, they're basically just intimidation and, and harassment against vulnerable people in a lot of circumstances. So the right to protest in a way which does not constitute harassment should absolutely be protected and provided for. However, the harassment of women outside medical facilities in an effort to physically, mentally or emotionally obstruct and restrain women from accessing services is not a legitimate form of protest. And I know it's been mentioned a couple of times in some of the interventions around um, Clause 6 and you know, the fact that some of those protections are already there in, in the law. Um, but I know the proposer of the bill had mentioned a few times that you know, clearly something isn't working. And you know, if the you know women and staff, or you know whatever the circumstances are, if they're not reporting it to the police and you know going down that that route, then what more can we do as an assembly?
to try and help you know, um, prevent some of this and to try and help support those people because obviously the system in place isn't working. So I know Paula had touched on it as well about is this a case of how we can enhance those protections? And I do think that in general it is regret regrettable that we're having this discussion and that safe zones are, you know, are even necessary. Um, but as a result of the pickets and the protests that we've seen um, in the past and not present, intimidating patients and staff, um, they have become necessary and the, the situation that we're in ne needs to stop. Um, people can protest, but in an appropriate place and not where services are being provided. And safe zone le legislation has been introduced successfully in some other countries. And I do think that it would send an, a really important message that there was support for such legal provisions and protections here. Um, I know that Emma touched on this in, in her remarks as well, that you know, after a long history of shame and hypocrisy on the issue, not just this issue around um, you know, abortion and whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, but there has been a culture of shame and hypocrisy more generally around dealing with women's health issues overall. And I think that it is only right that um, we all look towards a system that's going to protect and respect women, and in this case, um, pregnant people, and the choices that they're going to make, not only by providing safe and accessible services for them, but also by safeguarding their privacy, which is really, really important. Um, I don't think it's acceptable that anyone should be made to feel unsafe or unsupported when accessing health care, no matter what that health care is. And I'm very happy to support this bill today. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise in support of this bill, and I too want to commend um, Ms Bailey for bringing this bill uh, to the floor of the House today. Let me be clear, this is not a debate about our personal views on abortion, and I have pretty strong ones. This is about affording people the right to access health care free from harassment and abuse. Safe access zones for those seeking information and services in relation to abortion are long overdue. Everyone has a right to protest, but to hinder access to health care is unconscionable. When anti-vax protesters distribute inaccurate information and block access to health care, there is widespread condemnation, including from the Health Minister. Yet when anti-choice protesters distribute misleading information and block access to health care, there is widespread silence. Both are unacceptable. Both cause untold damage to our communities. In my own constituency of Foyle, there is a weekly show of intimidation at the health centre just up the street from my office. I have repeatedly raised this issue with the PSNI, and the response is always the same. They acknowledge the hurt that, is, uh, that it is causing uh, members of our community but they don't have the legal powers to act on it. This is why this bill is so vital. It lays down provisions that will help to protect people from these extremists. And they are extremists. I know many of you who identify as pro-life would certainly distance yourself from their behaviour. Alliance for Choice has gathered testimonies from people who have encountered the protesters. And let me paint a picture of what faces many women as they try to access health care. Signs of dismembered babies, shouting baby killer, hers, falling woman, actively blocking the entrance to clinics and the whole pavement, shouting over a speaker non-stop, calling us antichrist. Now let me share how this made people feel. I was so afraid of them, I got a taxi from the airport straight to the door of the clinic and got picked up and to leave the same way. I am a man, but I immediately thought of my daughter and other women like her. I am outraged and disgusted that these people are allowed to intimidate and bully pregnant women. I feel uncomfortable and trapped, said another. I am frustrated that the police were not moving them along. I feel extremely intimidated. I have PTSD from a complicated birth after I suffered a miscarriage, and these images are so traumatising. 
Their shouts of slogans and graphic imagery that distort, distort reality is causing real psychological damage. It needs to stop. None of us know the circumstances of those entering those clinics. It could be a woman who has suffered a miscarriage. It could be someone who is undergoing chemotherapy and is sadly infertile. It could be a woman who had her baby stolen in one of the mother and baby homes. All very traumatic experiences that could be painfully wrecked up by the actions of these people protesting outside our health care centres. The sad irony is that even though the Western Trust's early medical abortion service has been suspended uh, for six, six months now, these anti-abortion protests have continued to take place every Thursday afternoon in my constituency. On the issue of suspension of early abortion service in the Western Trust and the failure of the Minister to commission services, inaction from his department has forced more than 100 women from the Western Trust area to travel to England to ac or access pills online because they were able to receive local abortion care. The fact that Informant Choices has recently withdrew its central access point is a reminder of how precarious access actually is. Yes, BPAS have now filled the gap, but for how long? Why isn't our health department taking responsibility for this? I can't answer the former, but I can answer the latter. It's because the Minister of Health has refused to commission health services for women. He's the health minister. He has a duty of care to the people of Northern Ireland. He cannot simply abdicate his responsibility and ignore this issue. In truth, I suppose I shouldn't actually be very surprised. Depressingly, we see this hands-off approach to a wide range of women's health issues. We see it with endometriosis treatment right across Northern Ireland. We see it uh, needlessly, lives being curtailed because of failure to deliver appropriate modern treatment for women. We see it with the lack of progress in transition to the far more sensitive and effective HPV primary screening, something that has been rolled out in the rest of the UK. Anyone else given a sense of deja vu? Once again, we are receiving an equitable level of health care compared to our sisters across the water. And we see it with the abysmal access to contraceptive services through the Western Trust Family Planning Service. In Derry, there is currently a nine-week waiting time, and nearly 600 patients are waiting to be seen. Yet again, there is no sense of urgency. Yet again, reproductive health care has been utterly neglected. Yet again, our citizens have been failed. Mr Deputy Speaker, it was World Mental Health Day on Sunday, and MLAs from across this House we're united in sharing messages on the importance of mental health support. This bill is a chance to put those words into action. Safe access zones are a mental health issue. Patients and healthcare workers are routinely targeted with abuse and traumatised by anti-abortion protesters. Mr Speaker, let's work together to put the necessary protections in place and protect their mental well-being. Let's support this bill. I call Pat Sheehan. Kuram Falcha, Reverend Desh Hun Lord, Sharon Balishan Ogus, Bawailam Claire Bailey, uh Awalu uh Asan Balisha Horch Fever Agent Channel. Uh thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, on this bill. And I want to commend Claire Bailey for bringing it before the Assembly. And I mean, I don't think anyone would disagree to say that it's absolutely disgraceful and unacceptable that women, women trying to access uh, sexual or reproductive health services are being intimidated uh, and abused and uh, approached and solicited uh, without uh, wanting to accept any of that. Uh, there's no way a woman, and particularly women who may be vulnerable in these circumstances, who need to have such things as murder screamed in their face, there's no way that graphic material should be shoved into their faces. This is totally unacceptable. And I've heard people saying here today that the law already exists to deal with this type of behavior. Well, the law isn't working. 
Uh, and we shouldn't be trying to strengthen any law just for the sake of it. But because the law isn't working, the law needs strengthened. And that's what this bill does. It creates safe access zones for women who want the access to sexual and reproductive health services. And that's how it should be. And we've heard also about the, the right to free speech and the right uh, to protest. And neither of those is an absolute right. No one has a right to shout fire in a crowded cinema. Absolutely not. And uh, no one is allowed to protest right outside the front door of 10 Downing Street. So there are reasons uh, why rights such as free speech and the right to protest are not absolute. And it's right, therefore, that women who are trying to access health care shouldn't have to run a gauntlet of intimidation and verbal abuse uh, and being filmed and photographed uh, and their, their own privacy being undermined. Um, the legislation, as it stands, I heard, I heard Mr. Alistair making this point about the Public Order Act. It's not working. Is, is there anyone who can intervene now and explain to me where this law is working outside uh, clinics which are offering uh, counselling in some situations, uh, uh, um, health care for women who are having miscarriages, uh, and, and women who want to access sexual and reproductive uh, health services. Explain to me where the law is working. And I have some uh, personal experience, no. I have some personal experience myself. I have some, excuse me, sorry. I have some experience myself. I already answered the member. Uh, I have some experience myself uh, while walking past the Murray Stopes Clinic in Great Victoria Street one day. I was my, myself and the speaker, actually. We were accosted by a number of protesters outside that building who asked us to stand with them in their protest. And when we refused, we received the, the verbal abuse I couldn't even mention uh, in this house. I couldn't repeat it. It was disgraceful. It was unacceptable. And imagine, I could only imagine at that time the thought of vulnerable women going into that clinic and having to undergo and, and face that type of intimidation and abuse. It's totally and utterly unacceptable. The law isn't working. Uh, and, uh, and I thank Claire Bailey for bringing this uh, piece of legislation forward, uh, so that, or this draft legislation, so that safe access zones can be created for women who want to access uh, health services uh, without having to put up with the level of abuse that they are currently having to put up with. So I'd be supporting this uh, bill. Thank you. I call Liz Kimmins. Gourmet, good for you, Liz can call it, and I too welcome the opportunity to speak in support of this bill, which I feel is a very important piece of legislation. And if passed, I think it will go a long way to help deal with the issues that I certainly have been dealing with in my constituency for almost a year now, due to the huge impact of these protesters outside healthcare facilities on the many people who have been in touch with me. And the experiences detailed by other members in this debate, which have been very disturbing to, to listen to, are very similar to what I've been listening to from people across my constituency. What women have been subjected to is, is totally wrong. And I think it's a really sad state of affairs that in 2021, we are having to put legislation in place to protect women who are trying to access health care, which is legal and safe to ensure that they don't have to run the gauntlet of protesters during what, what is often a very traumatic time in their lives. And I have to say, I think we would be having a very different conversation if we were talking about men, and I know that won't go down well. But not only do these protests have an impact on women accessing abortion, who have, for whatever reason, have had to make that very difficult decision and are feeling very vulnerable at that particular time, but in my experience, have also had a very profound impact on the wider public, 
who are accessing healthcare facilities for a variety of reasons, and we need to take appropriate action to address this and to do that urgently. As I've mentioned, since the start of this year, we've witnessed protesters gathering at John Mitchell Place Health Centre in Newry and later outside Daisy Hill Hospital, with placards depicting distressing images and slogans and harassing staff and patients as they attempt to access these sites. And whilst these individuals claim to be trying to help people, this is certainly not the experience of those who have come into contact with the protests. And I am yet to see, like my colleague mentioned, any evidence of the positive impacts of their behaviour or these protests at any health care facilities across the board. But let me say too, I fully support the right to assemble and free speech, but I disagree with the notion that this bill prevents any of that. Nor do I agree with the, the, the DUP comments that this bill may lead to the banning of the distribution of leaflets or other information, because there have been plenty of other examples where there are exclusion zones outside facilities of, um, in terms of lobbying and protesting. Both of the healthcare sites that I have referenced offer a wide range of services, children's services, services for young people, adults, older people, people with disabilities and people with mental health conditions, all of whom have been subjected to images, slogans, harassment and abuse, which have caused them stress and anxiety when trying to access the health care they need. And I say this on authority because I have spoken to such a wide range of people. And I want to put this in context and share some of the real-life experiences of staff, patients, parents and other members of the public who have contacted me to highlight how they have been made to feel as a result of the distressing scenes they have been faced with. Particularly, I have received numerous messages from staff working across both of these sites, all with their own personal stories. Some have described how they were recorded while coming to and from work, had to ask protesters to allow them to, to make their way into the facilities and others reported being subjected to verbal abuse and harassment by some of these in individuals, as I say, all whilst trying to make their way to provide such a vital service to the public. And over the last 18 months in particular, I think it's important to remind members across this House how we have lauded the excellent work of the health and social care staff and the sacrifices each and every one of them have made to keep us safe. And I truly hope that we will be consistent in our approach and stand up for their right to access their work free from harassment and distress. One staff member described to me how she had personally experienced, in her own words, a horrific miscarriage last year and was now heavily pregnant again, which is obviously a very anxious time for any woman, but based on that personal experience is increasingly anxious. Um, and being faced with images and things were, were extremely triggering for her. She stated how she found herself reduced to tears almost every single day in her work when she encountered these protesters. Let me say very clearly, no one should be made feel like this, not least in their place of work. And I think it's also important as we talk in the context of COVID, how many women in particular were attending appointments alone due to the restrictions that were in place. And the anxiety of accessing, whether it be abortion services, maternity services, counselling following a stillbirth or miscarriage, or any other healthcare service alone, is particularly, your anxiety is particularly heightened um, for all of those people. The added stress of coming into contact with protesters who were, in, in my area, throwing holy water, water people, praying for your sins over a loudspeaker as they have seen it, displaying disturb, disturbing in, images or obstructing your path is totally traumatic and totally unacceptable. And I vividly recall a mother who contacted me in desperation, and that's the only way I can describe it, to have protesters removed from the gates of Daisy Hill Hospital in Uri, as she highlighted just how difficult this was for her adult son who suffered from severe mental health problems and was traumatised each time he attended his mental health appointments. She explicitly described the fear she felt as a mother who had already lost one son to suicide due to the mental health issues he faced. And she stressed that she needed her remaining son to be able to access the help he required free from distress so that she was not going to be burying another child. Accessing health care should be a private matter and no one, absolutely no one, has the right to interfere in someone else's life like this, regardless of what their opinion or view is. 
And before I finish, Mr. Speaker, I want to pay a particular tribute to a small group of women in Uri who came together in light of the widespread public outrage uh, on how women were and still are being treated at these sites, and they formed the group supporting women in Uri. Week in, week out, whatever the weather, they have stood in solidarity with women and families in Uri and to try and make their experiences a less traumatic one as they accessed health care. So, Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, I want to pay particular thanks to Ms Bailey for bringing this important bill to the House, and I would ask all members to put aside their personal views and take a humanitarian approach when considering what we are debating and support this bill for safe access zones for women. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I rise in support of this bill at second stage today, and I do thank my colleague for bringing this forward and for all the work that she has put into it over the last number of years. And I want to start by declaring what this bill is not. It is not a bill that removes the right to protest or congregation or religious expression or belief or indeed freedom of speech, nor is this a bill dealing with reproductive health care itself. This bill is about safety, it's about preventing harassment and intimidation, and it's about access um, to a balance of competing rights. There are people congregating outside a number of healthcare facilities here, which, as we've heard, can be threatening and intimidating to those entering the building, including staff who have to run the gauntlet just to access their place of work. These people are not standing there conducting a peaceful protest directed to people in elected office. If they were protesting against the law, or as they say it, they could stand outside the seats of government, but they are not doing that every day. The sole purpose of their actions is to harass women accessing sexual and reproductive health care, with no regard to the reasons or motivation of these women for doing so. These people only target women of what they perceive to be childbearing age, or those they deem to be involved. It doesn't matter if they're going into the building for work, to access legal health care or contraception, other family planning matters, for advice. They are all deemed legitimate targets by people congregating outside. They have been known to follow women and their families along the street. They take photographs of individuals that have entered or exited a building without the person's permission and consent, and then threaten to publish them. As we know, intimidation reached such a level at one location that volunteers came forward to offer people the opportunity to have someone escort them into the building if they feel that they would need this. And I know Ms Bailey was one of those volunteers, and I thank her for that and for outlining her experiences to date. I was too subjective uh, to the behaviour that has been outlined previously. Indeed, on one occasion when I went to the clinic for a meeting with staff members on approaching the building, I was grabbed by a woman with a plastic doll who confronted me touching and pushing my arm, asking did I know what my baby looked like and what was I going to do would be something that I would regret. Why was anybody harassed like this for entering a building for a meeting? On leaving the building, I was met by more people outside one with a poster of a graphic image which would not be shown before the watershed on TV, and then followed down the street by a different lady asking me was I at crisis point in my life and did I need her advice. Members, the last thing that anybody needs is a crisis point is the unsolicited harassment of a stranger to be shouted at in the middle of the street. The last thing anyone needs when entering their workplace is to be called a murderer. No one should have to endure such behaviour in accessing health care or their workplace. And I don't believe that this level of discomfort should be experienced by anyone. And it is a disgrace that this kind of behaviour actually goes on. And we need to send a strong message condemning this type of behaviour, that it will not be tolerated, and that if someone entered or entering a registered pregnancy advisory bureau or clinic, Unsolicited approaches and other activities designed to cause distress, like filming, recording, so-called counselling, and pamphlet distribution, cannot happen to them. Protest, I will give way. Um, it's certainly very distressing uh, to hear about the member's experience uh, when she was conducting her legitimate business uh, at a clinic, and she's explained uh, very vividly how she felt uh, uh, coming from it. Would you agree with me that if you were a vulnerable person at a very low point and at a crisis point in your life, you couldn't start to imagine how that person would feel 
getting the treatment that you got leaving that clinic? The member for his intervention, and I completely agree. It is not for unsolicited uh, strangers to be offering so-called counselling services to anybody in crisis point, be it for anything, uh, for any healthcare matter or for any matter at all. Um, there are plenty of support services out there. Um, although there needs to be a lot more um, for, for those um, people that need crisis support should they need it. Um, but protest is not against the law and as, we, as we've heard everyone has a right to it and it's deeply embedded in our recent history as a method for change. Protest is a necessary and crucial part of our society but the actions and images used by these groups and individuals and the words expressed to anyone entering and leaving buildings is not acceptable. Protest should not mean intimidation or harassing behaviour, and those involved in these cases do not have the right to impede access to healthcare. I do not see this type of protest occurring outside GP surgeries, or indeed in chemists or counselling offices. If it was, it would not be accepted and action would be taken. And this behaviour does amount to harassment and intimidation and the number of people involved have, that have even been charged with assault. However, the harassment laws in Northern Ireland only cover actions, as Mr Alistair and other members will know, and actions that occur on two or more occasions. Mr Alistair asked earlier on Clause 6, he will only know too well the inadequacy of the harassment laws, and so will other members of the Justice Committee. Given that we're currently looking to strengthen harassment laws around the Protection from Stalking Bill, which is nearing the end of committee stage, there must be a course of conduct involved. And Clause 6 is criminalising behaviour in a geographic location rather than looking at perpetrator or potential victim. That is why Clause 6 is needed, and that is what makes it different from the harassment legislation in Northern Ireland and indeed with the stalking legislation as well. So restraining orders were also mentioned. Uh, restraining orders, as we know, are not sufficient they are not open to everybody, and they do not protect people from abuse or from harassment in the way they, they need to do so in these cases. And they also have to go through court system, and all members here will know the issues with going through court system, and there are significant barriers in place. And it is my understanding that there has only been one successful conviction that has not been overturned for an assault on an employee of a sexual and reproductive health care charity. But this person is still allowed to stand outside and continue their actions. Perhaps this answers some of the members' questions today that they have posed on the adequacies and inadequacies of current law and why this bill is one that is needed. Those entering the building for an appointment or consultation may not return, so the behaviour does not come under the protection of current harassment laws because it is not a course of conduct. The Justice Committee and Assembly looked at this issue on the Domestic Abuse Act and we ensured that one or more occasion was included in that act for that reason. Secondly, police do not come out to every incident that is reported to them. As we are aware, the police service is stretched. It is under extreme pressures to deal with other issues. And thirdly, this, not having this bill is a reactive method in dealing with this issue, and it does not protect women from the present situation as it is. Even if the, the harassment laws were strengthened, it would still need a course of conduct to meet the definition of harassment. So a proactive, preventative method is what is needed. And I believe that this bill, and showing support for this, is an important step to those who realise harassment of anyone using any form of healthcare facilities throughout Northern Ireland will not be tolerated. No matter, no matter what our opinions are around certain aspects of sexual and reproductive health care service provision within the country, it is of utmost importance that rights are protected and upheld no matter what type of health care services they require. And everyone should be free to access advice and services free from harassment and verbal or physical abuse. Safe access zones are a step forward which have been discussed and debated even in the Commons before and in council chambers across Northern Ireland too. A recent motion in Belfast City Council passed unanimously, following on from same in 2017. Similarly, in Derry City and Strabane Council, 
Also in that year, Ards and North Down Borough Council members voted on a motion from ourselves to condemn all harassment and intimidation taking place outside facilities in Northern Ireland that offer reproductive health care, including attempts to physically block access to facilities and the filming and recording of staff and clients entering and leaving the building. This passed unanimously at committee. And I note some members of certain parties that sit on those councils are commenting on this bill today, totally against what their members have done at council level. Members, we will not tolerate groups of people standing outside GP surgeries and chemists providing prescriptions, healthcare advice, administering vaccination programmes, for example. So why do we not condemn the behaviour outside cl other clinics, which obviously affects women much more than it does men? And I thank my colleague for all her work on this, which has taken years to get to this point, as she has already outlined. And I would urge all members in this House to support this bill progressing at second stage. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I wish to begin by refuting the suggestion that to oppose this bill is to endorse harassment, uh, abuse or violence. It is none of those things. Uh, and I absolutely throw back that slur which has been cast at those of us who would dare to question the need for and the content of this bill. And in that same vein, we have had much diversionary emotive presentation in support of this bill, even to the point of calling an aid a distortion of baby loss week. We're talking about abortion. We're talking about the ending of babies' lives. But yet, there are those who in this chamber have sought to call in aid baby loss week, which is about those who lost babies not through choice. Yes? I appreciate the member for giving way, but will the member acknowledge that some of the images that are shared often at these protests might actually compound that trauma of baby loss awareness week. I've been contacted by constituents who have suffered miscarriage and are, are not happy about these images. Would the member acknowledge that? C could I remind me members to make sure that their microphone uh, is in front of them and, and they are speaking into it so that everything will be well, recorded? Those answer. persons would not be protected by this bill. This bill's definition of protected person is those going into these facilities or accompanying those going into these facilities. So the point the member raises is a non-point in the context of this bill. I'm being surrounded by requests, but certainly. Uh, start with the lady, if that's not offensive. I thank the member for giving way. I would ask the member to consider what he has just said, to think if he understands for one second the circumstances of any woman who finds herself in the position of needing a termination, and also ask him to consider whether or not it is appropriate to comment as he has just done. I consider all those things, and I consider it is. Mr. Uh, I thank you for giving way. Would he not consider for one moment that some of the women going in um, to these premises, seeking, either seeking a termination or seeking advice on a termination, are in some cases people who themselves have suffered miscarriage before, and part of the reason why they may be going in to seek that advice is because there are medical complications, personal reasons. So these aren't different categories necessarily in the way he draws, and it's deeply and profoundly offensive to many women and many families who suffer baby loss and sometimes have to make these very difficult uh, choices later on. The lady is going in to seek advice about complications in her pregnancy. She'll be going to her GP or, or a hospital. Don't think she'll be going to an abortion clinic. Well, I think I do need to make some progress. Uh, I'm generally generous with my uh, uh, allowing interventions, but I do want to uh, start. I haven't even started my comments uh, to any extent on this bill. So I'm not distracted from the fact that this bill, like any bill, therefore does require rigorous uh, scrutiny as to what it really is seeking to do. 
And you don't have to read very far into this bill to detect the direction of travel. Clause 1, 2. Acts within a safe access zone which may have the effect of preventing or impeding the access to the premises or influence, harassing, alarming, or distressing persons assessing the premises are criminalized. Let me read that again, but focusing on one word. Acts within the safe access zone which may influence persons accessing the premises are criminalized. Think about that. That this house has been invited to legislate that something that may, doesn't have to, may influence another, should be criminalized. Think of the mother, the distressed mother of the 14-year-old daughter who finds herself pregnant, who's going to a clinic to get an abortion. The distressed mother is begging her not to go through with the abortion. This law says the mother's the criminal. That is not where the state should be going in regard to this matter. If there's any doubt about that, turn to Clause 6. It is, in this section, 6-2, it is an offence for D. That's the person who's not a protected person, the defendant, D, 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 D the defendant, to do an act in a safe access zone with the intent of or reckless as to whether it has the effect of influencing in connection with the protected person attending the protected premises. So yes, the mother, the distressed mother of the 14-year-old who's pregnant, who's going for the abortion, is criminalized because she has the intent to want to influence her not to do it. How can that be right? And yet that is what this law does. And of course, let us not forget, the protected person can be a minor as well as an adult. This law is directed at that 14-year-old girl as much as it is at the 24-year-old woman. And yet we are picking upon the mothers, maybe distressed by that situation, who want to bring motherly influence to their daughter, who follow them down to the clinic, pleading with them not to have the abortion, and they become the criminal. There's nothing upright, proper, legitimate about that approach. I'll give way. Thanks to the member for giving way. Um, I, I again want to refer back to his earlier comments because you've just outlined um, a, a particular situation or, or circumstance. But I would again ask you, you, you took umbrage at the fact that members had made reference to the fact that this is Baby Loss Awareness Week. I would ask you again, can you say categorically that you understand the circumstances of every woman in the north of Ireland who seeks terminations? Because I don't think that you can. And therefore, how dare you criticise those women or suggest that those women haven't experienced a loss or some of them haven't experienced a Loss. Member have been listening. I was criticising those members of the Northern Ireland Legislative Assembly who abuse the very principle and ethos of Baby Loss Week in aid of the destruction of babies. That's what I was criticising. But think of another situation. That's what this bill actually means. Let's say someone through their own religious conscientious conviction against abortion. And the direction of travel in this bill is it will soon be a criminal it will soon be criminalized to have any view contrary to abortion. But let's take someone who has a religious conscientious conviction about abortion. 
and they decide. The abortion clinic is somewhere they're going to go, not to shout, not to lobby, not to block people, but they're going to go and hold up a poster. And that poster might simply have the immortal words of the Sixth Commandment. Thou shalt not kill. And because that in the terms of this bill is capable of influencing someone, causing them, as the protester intends, to stop and to think, do I want to kill the baby in my womb? Because it has the capacity to cause them to be influenced by that. That protester doing nothing but holding those few words is a criminal. That is a preposterous sit proposal. And yet, it gives us an insight into this bill. This bill is vindictive against freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is not just the right to express the palatable. Freedom of expression equally is the right to express the unpalatable. And yet, the person who reminds the users of the facilities of what, in their view, is a cardinal and sacred position that thou shalt not kill is the person who, in this, is criminalised. Thank the member for giving way. Um, it, it exasperates me the lack of self-awareness that the member has when I when I listen to to his contribution so far. But I would ask the member to, you know, does he agree that harassment in a, in, can be interpreted in many different ways? And for someone um, who's made that very very difficult decision, something that they've probably deliberated for weeks and days and, and nights and haven't slept um, and had to go in and make that very very difficult decision. That poster that you talk about may be interpreted as harassment because it's infringing on their right to make a decision about their own body and to, to come to a conclusion which isn't easy for any woman and something that you probably can't have an understanding of. Would the member agree with me? If the content of Holy Scripture is harassment, then maybe it bears out the point that Holy Scripture should be a conscience pricker in many, in many avenues of life. Yes, I'll give way. Mr. Alistair, for giving way. I, mean, I suppose it's really just to extend Ms. McKimmon's point around harassment, and that the member will, will be aware that current harassment law very much focuses on the person being harassed rather than the person who maybe thinks or doesn't think that they're doing the harassment. So, um, what um, uh, would the member say in relation to that? Should these people protesting have a self awareness around the potential of them harassing, particularly if it's a repeated offence? Let's deal with harassment. You draw me to a point actually that intrigues me about this bill. In clause one two that I read, it said it talks about influencing, harassing, alarming, or distressing. And again, clause six two, causing harassment, alarm, or distress. Now, harassment is defined but not in this bill. And harassment is defined in the protection from harassment order. And what is harassment? It's causing alarm or distress. So what does this bill mean about mean when it says harassment, alarm or distress? Is it just being tautologous? What does it mean when it says harassment? Since the very word harassment in our criminal law is already defined as alarm or distress. And yet, additionally, we have some ill-defined, undefined harassment in this bill. 
And when you go to the interpretation centre uh, uh, section, harassment isn't defined. So I'm no doubt the sponsor in Winding will tell us what harassment is if it isn't causing alarm and isn't causing distress. Because that's the only definition of harassment there is in our law. If we're bringing in a new definition, then it needs to be spelled out. What is it? And I think the House is entitled to ask and to know the answer to that question. Yes? I appreciate the member for, for uh, giving way again. But again, will the member acknowledge that under the current definition of harassment, the focus is on what the, the victim feels around that harassment? The point he's trying to make is about the protester, but if we were putting this into the context of a potential harassment offence, does the member recognise that that harassment is about the victim? You've talked about distress, distress of the victim. Does the member acknowledge that this isn't about what's necessarily defined in this bill? This is about what's currently defined in law. Does the, mem does the member recognise that while Whilst he's trying to make a point around what the protester might do, that their actions may actually be an offence. It's quite clear to me what the law means when it says cause alarm or distress. It means cause alarm or distress to a third party. Of course it is. Uh, so that, that's, that's not the issue here. But the issue is on that particular that we have now this undefined perception of harassment, which clearly isn't alarm or distress or the bill wouldn't have been drafted in that tautologous way. If it simply means alarm or distress, then you don't need the word harassment. So clearly it means more than alarm or distress, hence the use of the word harassment. What is that meaning? I don't know, because we're not told in this bill. Can I just draw attention to one or two other things in this bill? Clause 9 is about the exercise of functions. And this relates to the Department of Health. The Department must have regard to, amongst other things, safety and dignity of protected persons, the right to respect for private and family life, the right to manifest religious belief, and the rights to freedom of assembly and expression, set out in Articles 9, 10, and 11 of the Convention. And in particular, the right to protest. So we're told in Clause 9, that the department, and this is about making their zones, etc., their censorship zones, that they must have regard to the right to protest. But go back to Clause 8 2. Within eight weeks of receiving this notification, the department must designate, designate an area as a safe access zone. So there is no scope to be influenced by the uh, right to protest, about the manifestation of religious belief. It is expunged by 8.2. It is only there as pres for presentational purposes in Clause 9. And if ever there was any doubt about that, paragraph 5 of the explanatory and financial memorandum couldn't be clearer. This bill does not include provision for protesters. There it is, black and white. This bill is about expunging protest, about uh, oppressing protest. This bill, for all the fancy words of Clause 9 about having regard to protest, is in the business of the very Opposite. Yes, and on, on that point, would he agree with me that the very vague and open nature of this bill, uh, which he has quite articulately pointed out in relation to the contradictory nature when we go to uh, 9C uh, and, and that right to manifest in uh, religious belief, the freedoms of assembly and expression set out in Articles 9, 10, and 11 of the Confection. Convention is merely what seems to be an afterthought if we look at the functions and provisions provided in Clause 6. It's quite clear that it's there to try and paper over the fact that this bill is an all-out assault on freedom of expression, an all-out assault on the right to protest. Uh, and you know, the proof is in 8.2. The Department must make the order. Never mind what it has to have regard to notionally. It must make the order. So this bill is 
fraudulent in that respect in pretending that, in fact, a, the functions are exercised subject to Clause 9 and when they're overridden by the compulsion of Clause 8 too. That's the reality. On this point, well, are we in a situation where we have no law to deal with this? Well, we're not. I've already made that point in interventions. Harassment, and yes, points can be made that there has to be a course of conduct, which is defined in the 97 order as more than one occasion. Well, there's a very simple answer to that. Remove the course of conduct requirement in the harassment order. If that's the problem, that's the solution. But not a bill which carries you way, way into the realms of making it unlawful to try to influence someone. That's the real nub of the objection. So we do have a harassment laws. You can get a harassment injunction. You can have a restraining order under the harassment order, which uh, which is for future uh, attention, to put someone under a curb in terms of how they can act in future. So those things, amongst many more, already exist. Yes, a good way. I thank the member for giving way, and he has been very generous with his time, but does his exact point about harassment law, recognising that this needs to be a course of behaviour as in more than one occasion, and also outlining the um, restraining order requirements, not point to the need for this bill, that you cannot have a restraining order on one instance of harassing behaviour. It's for future behaviour. And in the instances that we're talking about, generally speaking, these women are not going back to the clinic. We've had justice bills, justice amendment bills before this House. Why did none of the members if they're exercised about this issue, not move an amendment to the harassment order to remove the code of conduct. That was the simple answer. Then it was something which had universal application, not just in respect of these protected premises. Uh, that was a far easier route to follow and one far less objectionable. And of course, I also remind you, there are powers under the public order, order of 87 Article 5, whereby the police, in the proper circumstances, can forbid public gatherings at locations. The law, you know, why are we reinventing the wheel on this uh, in that regard? It is already a breach of uh, the law to engage in offensive, malicious communications under the Communications Act, never mind the public order uh, uh, definitions, which also cover those manifestations. So we have the protection from harassment order, we have the disorderly behaviour and public order offences in the public order order, and all of that, you know, Article 9 of the public order order makes it an offence to use written material which is using threaten, threatening, insulting or abusive words. It's already there. It's in Article 9. So I do again say, uh, and in fact, for that, you can get a heavier sentence. You can get six months jail as opposed to what's in this bill. So why are we reinventing the wheel in, in this bill on those issues? And I do remind the House that other responsible legislatures and governments that have looked at this issue have come to a very different conclusion than this private member's bill. The Home Office examined this issue in great detail, decided in 2018, I think it was, that this was not the way to go. Scotland, often held up by some in this House uh, as a great example of how to do devolution, decided not to have these protection zones. And I do think that we are setting a dangerous precedent by trying to impinge other people's opinion. We really want to establish censorship zones where only the sponsor's approved set of values can be articulated. That is not the sort of society we need, that you're so oppressive of others' opinions 
that you create zones where only the approved set of values can be expressed. Yeah. I thank the member for giving way on this point. And would it occur to make reference to and elaborate on the fact that many in this House uh, have articulated that this would just be in a uh, health trust setting, but actually the wording of the bill actually makes it much more vague, meaning that this could, in effect, given its openness and vague nature, could not perhaps actually uh, spill out into other areas across our, our towns and villages in Northern Ireland? Uh, and one of the reasons for that is there is no limitation on the potential extent of the censorship zone, none whatsoever. Uh, it, could, it could embrace a whole town uh, if, if that's relevant. Uh, so, you know, this is a bill, an open invitation to this House to create censorship zones because people want to express within those zones values and views which offend the sponsor of this bill. They wish to decree that views which are disagreeable to those uh, like the sponsor are so wrong so wrong that they must be forcibly driven from the public square. Now, that really is the essence of these censorship or exclusion zones, that views are so disagreeable uh, that they cannot be heard, they cannot even be on a poster, lest they did have the effect of influencing someone. That, to me, is a flagrant attack on liberty and on freedom of expression. As I said before, freedom of expression equally embraces the expression of the unpalatable as well as the palatable. Otherwise, freedom of expression is meaningless. And the logic and the purport of this bill is to suppress freedom of expression, to drive it from the public place, from the public forum, on the basis that it is disagreeable to the views of others. That's totalitarianism. That's not liberty, such as many in this House from time to time proclaim a belief in. So I do say to this House, this is not a bill that I can support because it is a bill which goes far too far, which is far too oppressive of rights of freedom of expression and rights of protest, all in the interest of excluding anything but the pro-abortion view. Thank you. I call Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I raise to support this bill and also to offer my solidarity to those women uh, who have been intimidated while trying to access reproductive health care. Uh, it is never acceptable to impede someone's access to health care. It is even more condemnable when the kind of health care they are accessing is a source of great stigma already, and they have likely already overcome many barriers to get there. I also want to thank and quote the Lands for Choice Deputy Speaker, who have been unequivocally clear on this matter. They stated, and I quote, Whatever your party or personal stance, it's completely unacceptable that women and pregnant people, their friends and families and health care workers should be forced to run the gauntlet of abuse and harassment. This would, be, would not be tolerated for vasectomy or any other health care, reproductive and other ways. Indeed, some members would do well to listen to that advice. There have been claims, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from uh, anti-choice organisations that this bill is oppressive and attacks their right to assembly. I think it's uh, clearly hypocritical, Deputy Speaker, for some organisations who have uh, members convicted of harassment outside some of these clinics uh, who brag about people not seeing harassment yet to speak about oppressive measures. Organisations deemed by judges to have been forcing any women of childbirth age to identify the reasons for entering a Mari Stopes clinic. They have thrown holy water, as we have heard already, at pro-choice activists gathering Newry on a weekly basis and claim that women and their health care providers are guilty of murder. They hold giant 
graphic images which can be entirely traumatising uh, for women who have had a crisis pregnancy or indeed a miscarriage. This is oppressive and it is exactly this kind of, these kind of tactics which make this bill uh, necessary at all. But I do want to pick up on the point, Deputy Speaker, about the right to assembly and the right to protest. In my opinion, this bill is not an attack on the right to protest and it is deeply unfortunate that safe, zones, uh, safe access zones are necessary at all. But they are necessary because of sustained campaigns of hatred and harassment which do not have some inalienable right to continue even under the guise of protest. Deputy Speaker, I am an ardent defender of the right to protest, as many in this chamber will know. I have defended Black Lives Matter protesters who were shamefully targeted by the, by the PSNI. And of course, I myself have protested through the years for reproductive choice and will continue to do so. Those who stand on the other side of this debate, on the other side of this chamber, to me, uh, are still free to protest, still free to have their voices heard, but they should not be free to frighten, shame, or chase anyone away from the door of a healthcare uh, clinic. I would ask, where was the DUP when there was curbs on the right to protest for Black Lives Matter protesters last summer? Absolute silence. I hope that those in this House, Deputy Speaker, who have opposing views to myself and others on the issue of abortion will have the same vigour on this uh, issue uh, when, they, uh, when they challenge uh, anti-vax protesters uh, outside hospitals, but I somehow uh, doubt it. Mr Speaker, I also want to return to those people uh, who have been targeted by these harassment campaigners. And not all of them, as people have indicated, are seeking an abortion. Some of them are family, friends or partners. And none of them should be subjected to such harassment and uh, treatment. As is the case, many consequences of the lack of abortion access here. They have had to speak up and tell their stories, which can be incredibly difficult. And I want to thank them for speaking out against these groups. I also, Deputy Speaker, want to turn my attention to the Minister for Health and all the members of the Executive in this chamber. The fact that we still have such stigma around abortion is a direct consequence of the failure to deliver free, safe, legal and local access to abortion. It is one of the worst indictments of the kind of politics that dominates this place. Women and pregnant people are failed every single day by the lack of services, basic information and support. It is an international shame and disgrace and embarrassment, and I hope that the words of people who have suffered crossing the threshold of clinic clinics in the north will give this assembly some impetus uh, to put those services in place. Uh, last word, Deputy Speaker, I think has to go to informing choices uh, in their briefing, and they stated, we are aware of clients who have been attending counselling and the sessions were pr uh, pro proven beneficial, but the activities of individuals outside the building adversely affected them, and as a result, they decided not to continue with counselling. So all the nice words about mental health awareness and mental health services and mental health support, I would remind members of that quote and that comment, and bear that in mind when I come to vote uh, today. So I want to thank uh, Informal Choices, Lands for Choice. I want to thank Claire Bailey for bringing this bill, and I uh, support it, and I urge other members to do so as well. Thank you. I call Matthew Till. Thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise um, to strongly support um, this bill and commend my colleague from South Belfast, uh, Claire Bailey, for introducing it. She's been um, a stalwart uh, on uh, reproductive rights and associated issues um, in this assembly and outside it, and she deserves real credit for it. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I will touch on, since I'm one of the last to speak, though I'm sure the bill sponsor probably will too, some of the um, uh, somewhat bizarre and occasionally fairly hair-raising and offensive things I've heard just in, while I've been uh, waiting to speak. Um, one of the previous speakers, Mr Alistair, talked about um, uh, the potential uh, for um, uh, the offensive malicious communication to, um, to, be, to be used in relation to protests. I, I'm slightly wondering whether his speech should be referred uh, for uh, malicious communication, to be honest, because it contained um, fairly uh, ob many objectionable statements that will be deeply offensive, not just to people who are seeking um, terminations for whatever reason, but I'm afraid to women in general. Uh, and I, sp I speak co conscious of my own position here as a man who um, stands up to talk about things, these things, knowing that I will never be in the position uh, of any woman seeking to access these services and, and being harassed. Uh, I will give way in one second. So it's very important that when we're speaking about these matters, these very sensitive matters, that we do so with respect. Uh, understanding um, and, uh, and decency. I will give way briefly. To the members' um, opposition to freedom of expression, is he now proclaiming opposition 
to the privileges of this House? No, I was not. I, I was merely making comment on his speech, and, and, and I think, given, given his uh, record of robust commentary and debate in this speech, he, he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't uh, want it uh, any other way. I will say, in relation to this point about protest, it's completely a. Uh, I mean, I, I think it can be um, dismissed relatively comprehensively. The previous speaker, Mr. Cahill, who does have a strong record of protest. Uh, registered his own view that this does not uh, involve a significant infringement on uh, the right to protest. And I agree with that, and I agree with that for uh, one very big reason. This doesn't stop anyone protesting any issue. It doesn't stop anyone who objects to uh, abortion provision in Northern Ireland or anywhere else protesting. Uh, they, but what it does stop them doing is it stops them harassing people outside, stops, stops them harassing women outside premises where either abortion services or advice on whether to seek an abortion, because let's bear in mind that this is not just about women who are going to access a termination itself. It's about women, often very vulnerable women, often young women, often women in very uh, um, vulnerable positions seeking to get advice and information. Um, it's about preventing that harassment. And let's be absolutely clear. Um, uh, it doesn't infringe on anyone's right to protest anywhere else, because if the issue is about the legal provision for abortion, I'm strongly pro-choice and believe in that we should have long before now provided in law for women's ability to seek reproduc full reproductive health care. But if people want to protest that outside this, this building, Parliament buildings, any day of the week, they're entitled to do it. That's the place to do it, because we're people who make laws. Um, that's totally different from uh, distressing, lurid images in front of people who are seeking services. I will give way to Mr. Carroll. I thank the member for giving way. Would the member also agree with me that this bill is actually quite limited in terms of where those uh, posters and Im uh, images, placards, whatever, can be displayed? So, for example, uh, my understanding of this bill is the very offensive, uh, damaging, traumatising images that uh, adorn Belfast City Centre and others uh, will still be allowed to exist, as much as I have deep opposition to those traumatic and offensive images. Well, exactly. He's right. And of course, uh, this is why it's called in the bill, safe access zones. It's not about preventing the right to protest on this issue uh, at all. I will give way in one second, but I also want to, raise, to address one other point that um, Mr. Alistair made, which is about the um, chilling effect on what he called the provision of motherly advice or close family members um, uh, advising young women or trying to persuade young women not to go through with these procedures. Look, women in these positions are very vulnerable, but the idea that this law prevents any family member or any friend from having conversations, or even, yes, uh, doing as he says, suggesting that they don't proceed with the termination, is completely false. There is nothing in this bill whatsoever which prevents any family member from talking to their family member. Um, where, 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 uh, I'll, hap I'll happily give way if he, if he, if he's going to, if he, has, he can tell me where it, it outlaws people having conversations with family members. Six two. Anyone who seeks to influence someone within one of these zones uh, could well be the mother of a child. If it's within the zone, then you're not allowed to influence, no matter how motherly that influence might be. I'm glad I let the member give that intervention inside one of these zones. Presumably, if they are their mother, then they uh, either uh, share the same house or they can meet in a different premises, which isn't outside the, the a, a, a clinic. I'll happily give way to Ms Woods. Forgive me, I just want to point out to um, other members of in protected first persons 4B um, that would be covered with the accompanying person described in paragraph A at the invitation of that person. I, th I thank the member for that, uh, for that welcome intervention. It's absolutely critical just to, to nail this point. There's nothing in this bill which prevents family members having conversations with people who are seeking terminations uh, at all. It simply creates safe access zones, which prevents women from being harassed. Um, and let's be clear, lots of this goes beyond harassment uh, at times. It's deeply unsettling, deeply threatening. These are some of the most lurid um, at times pretty um, uh, exploitative and, um, and unpleasant images that, uh, that are used to, um, to, her to, to intimidate and um, harass women. I won't go through uh, all um, the clauses of the bill in detail because um, others have, but as I've said, um, uh, I I've gone through this bill and uh, I am comfortable that it properly balances the right uh, um, uh, the right of women to seek reproductive health care. I will give away in a second, as I promised to, to um, Ms Bunting. 
the rights of women to seek reproductive health care and also um, the right to freedom of expression and protest. Those are both rights which need to be upheld. It is also worth saying that the, right, the, the rights of women uh, to seek reproductive health care have been denied in this society for decades. So it ill behoves those who are now complaining about the right to either freedom of assembly or free speech or protest to talk about rights given the systematic denial of women to seek basic reproductive health care that existed uh, in other parts of, uh, yes, the United Kingdom. And some of these same people are very good at reminding us uh, about uh, rights that uh, attach to, to, to citizenship of the United Kingdom. Well, they didn't want uh, rights for women in this place for a long time. They now have them, and they should be able to uh, access them without harassment and threat. I will give way to Ms. Bunting. Order members, we now return to the second stage debate on the Abortion Services Safe Access Zones Bill. And I now call Matthew O'Toole to resume his speech. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I do not have uh, much more progress uh, to make in my remarks. As I said before um, we uh, broke up before lunch, uh, I and my party uh, support this bill. I am strongly supportive of the um, uh, I'm strongly supportive of the intention of the bill and the detail of it. I think it very reasonably balances, uh, and having gone through all the clauses and what is a, a, a concise and clear bill, uh, I think it clearly balances the, um, uh, the, the uh, it clearly balances the right to both protest and freedom of speech, but also the. Um, uh, the, the right of women uh, and girls to access uh, reproductive health care in a way that is safe um, and uh, where they are not harassed uh, by individuals. Some of the questions, some of the um, complaints raised thus far have frankly been, uh, I'm afraid, ridiculous in terms of um, some of the claims made, uh, and I covered those before we finished speaking. Um, uh, I, I think it is worth saying, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this comes in the context of, as I mentioned before we broke up, the fact that women here have been systematically and for a very long time uh, denied uh, the e equal right to uh, reproductive health care services and abortions where necessary here, unlike in, um, uh, in other jurisdictions in the UK and indeed now in the south of Ireland. So, it is even more important that in the absence of a properly commissioned service, and I would use the opportunity of speaking on this bill, to call on the Health Minister to make progress in terms of um, commissioning uh, abortion services in Northern Ireland, because we have a fragile situation. The fragility of a situation which was, uh, in a sense, kept going for uh, uh, I, I believe 18 months for by informing choices who operated an access point giving information and um, uh, signposting women in uh, often extremely vulnerable uh, situations. They now are not in a position to continue that service anymore. It has been taken up by BPAS, the British Pregnancy Advisory Order, Service. Order, order. C can I remind the member that this bill is about safe access zones? I am allowing a degree of flexibility, but I would draw the member back to this debate. I think it is very important, Mr Speaker, that this debate is placed in the context of access to abortion and the fact that women, uh, now that this service is legal in Northern Ireland, legal uh, in my view in a way that is long overdue, it is clearly important that uh, provision, legal provision having been made for this, that um, women are able to access in a way that is free from harassment. But it is also worth saying that even before provision for this was um, uh, Legal, uh, it, it fully legal in Northern Ireland. We do know that premises in uh, Belfast have been um, uh, picketed, and um, uh, even uh, women and girls seeking to access advice when they couldn't access a termination in Northern Ireland, they were still picketed and harassed with unacceptable images in whether it was the Mary Stopes Clinic or. Um, or any other premises where they were seeking to access that advice even before it was uh, lawful. So it is in the context of the legal position vis-à-vis -vis abortion provision and commissioning. In conjunction to um, approving of this bill, I think it is overdue that we have the clarity and consistency of a properly commissioned service, because that will also um, enable um, those medical professionals who are providing this service to feel that they have 
frankly, the weight of these institutions, but also uh, senior management and um, the, uh, the HSE behind them in terms of delivering this service, uh, which is legally provided for, but it now needs to be properly uh, commissioned. Mr um, Deputy Speaker, uh, I won't go through all of the details of the clauses. I covered some of them um, before, uh, before we broke. Um, I think this is a concise clear bill. Uh, I, I think all of the um, complaints around um, uh, freedom to protest uh, can be easily dealt with. I think there is a clear problem which is particularly acute in this jurisdiction in part because of the um, vagueness around um, uh, the commissioning of the service and the commissioning of services, which I think that grey area, frankly, uh, allows some of the protesters using these unspe often unspeakable images to feel that they have a bit more wiggle room that they're, that in harassing women in this way, that they, that they might have, um, that they might make a bit more progress if the, than they would if there was proper, um, uh, pl cl clearly commissioned services. So I think that needs to come in conjunction with this. Um, but in conclusion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I am uh, very much in favour of um, uh, this bill passed its second reading, and I look forward to it uh, proceeding swiftly, though with obviously the necessary scrutiny, but swiftly, hopefully through um, uh, committee stage, and hopefully getting royal assent before um, this, uh, these institutions uh, hopefully break up uh, for the election next year. This is one essential piece of legislation, something we should prioritise getting done, uh, and it's much more important than um, uh, engineered crises and histrionics. This is something real that affects real women and girls in our society now. Uh, let's proceed and get it done. Uh, and I, um, I, as I said earlier on, I commend the bill sponsor for bringing it to the Assembly. Thank you. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to support the principles of this bill today at second stage. Safe access zones around a health care clinic. I really don't know how we can disagree with that. And I do appreciate that this is specific to abortion clinics, but had it not been specific, would members and others have an issue with it, particularly if there were similar behaviour? I cannot change the law relating to abortion in Northern Ireland. That was a decision taken by the United Kingdom government. And people have talked about democracy, but like it or not, Northern Ireland remains under the jurisdiction of the UK Parliament, which is supreme to this one. So what happens in Westminster is democracy. Northern Ireland elects 18 MPs to the Commons, so maybe have a word with them if you disagree with the law, and particularly those who had the ear of Downing Street at the point on which this law was made. I appreciate, however, there are attempts to frustrate the implementation of this law, and perhaps these protests are an example of that. However, no one is breaking the law accessing these services. If anything, some protesters, given their behaviour, which is extraordinary to the protests, so it is imperative that we protect those using these clinics, as well as those who work in them, because it is the law. Some have also talked about current laws, in particular harassment laws, and why not utilise and or strengthen these? Because yes, harassment law is poor, and it's poorly implemented. To that end, I instigated domestic abuse legislation five years ago, recognising how poor harassment law is. And harassment law, even if it is improved, is reactionary. It is pursued after the offence has allegedly occurred, after the harm has been done. Now, I appreciate that if the law is robust enough, it may act as a deterrent. But how likely is that, particularly when those creating this form of harm do not recognise it themselves? What I like about Ms Bailey's bill is that it seeks to prevent harm. It does not wait until after the harm is done. It is proactive rather than reactive. It is protective rather than weak comfort after the event. And we should be seeking to stop harm. In Corian, there have been several incidents which have resulted in physical and mental harm of both those protesting as well as those accessing and working in the clinic. This is not good. It has created a hostile atmosphere. It scares people. It traumatises many, not just those accessing and working in the clinic. I've been contacted by people simply walking by or into the clinic for other services because the clinic in Coleraine is a community clinic. They have described to me aggression, violence. Others have mentioned the images. Um, I've been contacted by parents expressing distress at these images, unable to shield their ch children from seeing them. Women who have suffered miscarriage, having those images foisted upon them. It's truly awful. This is Baby Loss Awareness Week, where women and families will share their heartbreaking stories of baby loss 
and the pain they will inevitably carry with them for the rest of their lives. To then be subject to this behaviour is really unbelievable and not something anyone in this House should accept. And really, what type of freedom of speech is it when it limits others because of the harm it is creating? Because being traumatised is not being free. Being harassed is its own prison. I'll share a personal experience, Deputy Speaker. I attended the community clinic in Corian for contraception <coughs> in August. I was scheduled for an appointment, and I was terrified going to that clinic to access family planning services, as is my right as a woman. But I was scared in case someone might have accosted me, shouted at me, shoved leaflets in my face, and I very nearly cancelled my appointment. I did, however, reassure myself that if someone did approach me, I would explain to them that I was accessing other health care. This is what we are doing to women. We are putting them in a position to have to explain themselves, disclose their health care, to, ironically, to the very people defending the right of medical confidentiality in this very house yesterday when it comes to double vaccination, yet feel that they can interfere in people's confidentiality when it comes to reproductive health care. And I'm sure you're thinking that me or any other person doesn't have to disclose my information. But this behaviour, this environment that is created through these protests and, and, and other violent uh, action, is not giving women that choice. And I'm not going to go into detail as to why I was there. But let me say this, being female is invasive. Until you grow a uterus and experience this, you cannot imagine how difficult health care can be for a woman. And that's even when we're healthy. So let's put distance between these uh, people accessing in health care, which they are entitled to, and protests and behaviour which harms them. I worked in pharmacy for a number of years, and I was trained in medical confidentiality. And let's be clear, confidentiality is not just about what you speak or what you tell someone. It's as much about not acknowledging someone because you're familiar with them, having seen them in for a medical consultation, which could indirectly indicate their treatment. And it is very important that we protect people's medical information. I actually think Claire's bill does this generally. It adds protection for health care. And please correct me if, I wrong, if I'm wrong, but this already happens at hospitals for all patients. I don't believe protesters are allowed in hospital grounds. They have to do it at a distance. And due to a family matter this week, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have been in Causeway Hospital quite a lot. And my goodness, Patients, families and staff do not need this, yet they are saving uh, people's lives, they are keeping their heads above water. So I am 100% glad that we protect our hospitals, but why wouldn't we do this in any other healthcare setting experiencing similar pressures? To come back to my personal story, I am fine, because at that point I hadn't actually realised that those services have been moved to Causeway Hospital, thereby creating an organic buffer zone, an example where Ms. Bailey is, what Ms Bailey is proposing can work. And those who wish to exercise their right to protest or witness can continue to do so, albeit from a safe, appropriate distance that does not diminish health care or create further harm for the patient, health and social care staff. The issues that I spoke to earlier of the previous clinic have gone, and I understand those who continue to protest do so, but that atmosphere, that hostility is gone, and the danger has moved, not just for the patients, the health and social care staff, but for the protesters themselves, who in the previous clinic were finding themselves in situations. I have spoken to those who protest because I genuinely do want to understand their concerns, as they are elect representative as much as I am for anyone else. So I do take time to listen to all sides of this argument. And they've described to me that this type of protest is what they would describe as witnessing. However, it feels that it has gone beyond this. And I would actually ask protesters to reflect on what their actions are doing to others, because the victims and, um, are, are, cannot be removed from what these protests are doing. Indeed, this is what this bill is actually focusing on. What these the people these protests are being um, affected by and the victims. And it is not to hinder free speech, it is to protect others. Indeed, protests can still take place, but at a safe distance. I fully recognise the right of free speech, but I also recognise that speech ceases to be free when it limits the freedoms of others. The law recognises this too, through hate crime, discrimination, incitement to hate, etc. And hopefully in the future, this bill. To conclude, I want to talk about um, trauma 
Often we hear pro-life people say that they want to support women to make better choices around abortion, and I, to an extent, appreciate that. But I put it to these people that this witness or protest is not supporting women. It's traumatising them, which in itself will lead to poor choices that they will also disagree with. So they are effectually reinforcing what they would describe as bad choices. Mr Deputy Speaker, this doesn't occur across the UK, but maybe it needs to. We need to focus on protecting people and patients. That must be where we start. I appreciate other members have pointed to clauses of this bill and how technically it may not work. That's what further cons our consideration stage is for. So if there are those issues, I would certainly welcome those members to bring forward um, uh, those edits so that we can potentially uh, focus this in the right way. Um, I think this is an important bill and I commend the member for tabling it to the House. I now call Claire Bailey to conclude and wind up the debate. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and it's been really greatly heartening, I have to say, um, listening to the majority of members so far who have spoken, um, but who have also so obviously understood and engaged with the impact of these anti-abortion protests on women, for telling your personal stories and for acknowledging the widespread um, nature of what we're starting to see. I suppose in closing, I'm going to focus really on issues that have been raised. Um, and as has just been mentioned by Claire Sugden in her comments, um, this is a second stage debate. Um, and if passed today, this bill will have further stages where amendments can be made. Um, to date, I think that all comments would be I would be more than welcome to have the, the conversations to see can we get a reasonable amendment to relay any, any issues raised. But um, I suppose I'll start with um, early on. Mr Buckley um, was quite critical, I think, um, when he pointed out that there had been a lack of consultation since 2016 and that that was a number of years ago. But I'd started working on this bill back in 2016. Um, I'm, Maybe the member is not aware, but um, it is worth noting that there is a personal cost to members in going to consultation on a private member's bill, that that's not a cost covered by this assembly, um, but it was a cost I was more than happy to, to do, um, and if necessary, we'll continue to do, we'll do again, but if it gives any assurance, I um, have continued, and I will continue for the length that this is in the, the process um, to engage with all bodies, and that's the Equality Commission, the Human Rights Commission, the PSNI, the Health and Social Care Trust, their staff, women, the Secretary of State, Westminster. I've even gone to Australia, I believe me, not just you know, in this virtual world that we live in, but um, I have had meetings with the proposers of the bill that was implemented and passed in Australia. I've spoken to um, cross-party MPs about their views and how that was achieved, and I've listened to the tragic circumstances that led to the bill being brought forward, and that was when a security guard was murdered doing his job, and that's what led to Australia implementing safe access zones. And I will continue at every stage to consult, to discuss, and to talk with as many people as possible, because I want this bill to be right, rather than vindictive, as Mr Alistair claims. Other issues were raised, um, believing that this could cause undue stress to PSNI resources, and um, currently I just simply refute this. I see this, as the, this bill as the complete opposite to that case. Um, I have engaged with police, I have worked with police, I have FOIs from police. I know how much the police have done, how many times they've been called, how much resource they've had to put into this, um, and even just um, under a freedom of information request, just for the Mary Stokes Clinic alone, um, you know, at one point between October 14 and October 17, that they had a reported number of 83 incidences. Um, 17 that were passed to the Public Prosecution Service, and the list goes on. They also had permanent presence at the clinic doors, and that's extensive resource for PSNI. And today, they're still 
going through these processes, while they might not have a permanent presence at premises, they're still getting the calls and dealing with the complaints. So I'm hoping that if this bill was enacted, that it would lessen the resource on the PSNI and also give them the capability to deal with this quickly, efficiently, um, without um, heavy sanction on anyone. The number of concerns raised um, that the potential this bill could set in terms of a precedent would be to roll back or restrict other rights and freedoms. Uh, I think that giving out leaflets was one example used, but I also think that's a very interesting example though. I mean, giving out leaflets sounds like a very passive, pretty pleasant pastime. We all do it around elections, for example. Um, but when you understand that these leaflets are filled with misinformation, with non-fact, when they're being forcibly put into people's bags, pockets or hands, claiming all sorts of nonsense like abortion won't unrape you or abortion will give you breast cancer, then I hope that it could be understood as a little bit more intimidatory or sinister in some cases, but I'd come back to those points. When anyone cares to compare this concern about setting a precedent, really need to direct them to other countries who have passed similar measures. And some members have already mentioned a few of those countries. We have seen this pass and happen in some states in the United States. We've seen it happen in South Africa, in France, Canada, Australia, as I've mentioned, and England via council powers. And none, not one of those countries has it led to the rollback on other rights or other unintended precedents being set. Sure. Just further the, the point the member made, I don't know if she's aware of, um, there was a challenge to um, uh, one of the council powers she talked about in relation to in Ealing Council in West London, and it was, the challenge to it was, I understand, thrown out by the judge. Thank the member for that. And it is, of course, anyone's you know, legal right if they want to challenge any legislation that they can do so. Um, but this bill, again, doesn't interfere with that either. Um, so I'm going to leave that one. While it is a valid point to be cognizant of, um, I have no evidence to show that that will happen. Um, a few members I also think that Clause 6 is too vague, uh, and it was brought up quite a, a number of times, and I suppose namely it was Mr Buckley, Ms Bradley and Mr Alistair who were raising concerns, um, and I will continue to, to listen to those concerns, to look at can I make Clause 6 much more effective, and if I can, I will be more than happy to have those conversations at any time, um, and if the bill is passed, we'll continue to work on further scrutiny of that. Um, but again, all three members have dismissed support for the bill at this stage. Um, so I do doubt that there's anything that I could say now or any clarity that I might be able to provide that may change, or should I say must change, or might change, or should change, or does change. Given that this is a debate, it's probably best to test that out with that may change, because words are important where they are on that, but if passed, I'm more than willing to continue engaging. And Mr Alistair in particular has taken umbrage with Clause 6, and particularly 6A, um, influencing a person within any safe zone. Um, and used, I think, was um, graphic imagery as one example of potential influencing, um, and also um, a case of a mother and a daughter as another, maybe a mother trying to stop her daughter accessing those premises. Um, well, I just want to reiterate on that, that the point of this bill is to prevent undue influence of a protected person within a safe zone. It is not to mute any anti-choice point of view or campaign. If that was my intent, then this bill would go much further than a potential five metre radius at a clinic or premises door. If you, yep. Say it's to avoid undue influence. 
when that's not the terminology of the bill. The bill is the simple word influence. So that's much more than undue influence. I thank the member for that. I don't think I said undue. I think I said influencing. Um, so influencing either way. You know, if a person wants to access services, wants to enter premises, whether that be for access and services, whether that be for work, whether that be for any other service within that building, then they should be able to do so. And that's just where I stand on that point, and that's the essence behind this bill. Yep. Would there be um, a, a, an opportunity um, at consideration stage to potentially strengthen the concern that Mr. Allister has, you know, given that that influence could be a positive influence rather than a negative one, you know, uh, as being suggested? Thank the member for that, of course, and, and I hope that I've made that clear. I'm willing to engage at any stage if this bill passes and if it does progress to make clarity for anything where people feel that there is vagueness um, and any language used within the bill can also be changed at any time through consideration and further consideration stage. Um, but I have genuinely yet to hear any situation where a mother is within sight of a clinic door and still attempting to dissuade her daughter not to go inside for any professional help, information, advice or service. But if that did arise under this bill, um, and as uh, Mrs. Wu, Ms. Sorry, it was not a Mrs. Ms. Woods pointed out um, during her contribution, that mother is also a protected person. If she's attending as the partner of her daughter, Yep. The protection in that regard is conditioned if the person is there at the invitation. So if the, if the daughter invites the mother to go with her, she is a protected person. If the mother goes in pursuit of the daughter to influence her not to have the abortion, she is not a protected person. Thank you for that. I think that's exactly what I was saying there. So if she is attending as the partner with her daughter, then she is a protected person. But if she is not attending with the consent of her daughter, then she will be subject to the same restrictions as everyone else within that zone. We should also be aware of the impact that comments on baby loss has had. I found that quite distressing during the debate. Um, and I do want to remind members that many, many women suffering from baby loss for any reason also attend family planning clinics, they also attend other healthcare settings, and they often report on how distressing it is to be confronted with these campaigns at the door. So please, members, be mindful of that, because it is a very real fact. And of course, to cover any unintentional criminalisation for any person unaware of either their behaviour or the existence of a future potential safe zone, there is Clause 6.4, the Defence Clause. And that states that it is a defence for D, be the person, to show that they D did not know and had no reasonable way of knowing that the protected person was in a safe access zone. Now, that's a deliberate insertion of that clause. Mr. Alistair, I'm coming back to you again. <laughs> but, Mr. Alistair, you're very well versed in legal courtroom settings. You're a practitioner, a trained QC, I think. So, you understand very well how law works. And I suspect that you're using the debate really today to highlight your personal view on abortion and distract from the intent of this bill, um, because this bill is really about seeking the balance of competing rights for all involved. It's not discriminating or favouring one or the other, but about trying to accommodate safe access while allowing the right to protest and assembly. Yep, you can. I'll let you intervene. <laughs> I don't think the member can say it's about uh, providing for all. And the very purpose of the bill is to expunge protest and influence within these zones. 
That's providing only for the member's worldview and expunges any other view that anyone could express within those zones. So it's not, there's no balance in it, whatever. Thank you, the member. You'll be very aware that um, those freedoms of assembly are caveated and that this bill is within the caveat set out. So it's not an unrestricted um, right and freedom to continue to allow what is happening. There are limitations, um, and this bill is designed and drafted within those limitations. And I think you know fine well that that's the case. But there's also those competing rights of those seeking access and those with the right and freedom of assembly. But there's also, let's not forget, a right and a duty placed on the Health and Social Care Trust to protect their staff. And that's a huge consideration because right now many staff are not feeling protected and health trusts and chief executives are struggling to find a way to do that. And the expense placed on them and putting extra measures in place is not an expense that anybody would want to place as a burden on an already overstretched health system. But as to the concerns around ambiguity, again, around the lack of clarity contained in Clause 6, I think that uh, it was Mr Chambers, actually, in response to Rachel Woods' contribution, he stated clarity on this, in my opinion. In determining impacts, what's... <coughs> What's needed is that you need to ask the person, the person who's had that unsolicited or unwanted approach, who has their access blocked or who's been recorded going about their work. Ask them, how did that make you feel? Because that will clear up any ambiguity and that is what needs acted upon. But I suspect that we could go round and round the houses on this for a long time. Um, these are issues that, as I say, I'm more than happy and very welcome to receive constructive comment on. And if this bill is passed today, I will look forward to the committee scrutiny and, of course, engage um, with all concerned, including the PSI, PSNI, as I've already said, on this. I turn into Clause 8.2. Again, it was a wording issue raised. Um, and I feel that it would just be maybe a bit less effective for a bill or indeed an act if it was to become to instruct a department to maybe or perhaps do something, but rather it's best to remove ambiguity and instruct directly and therefore the word used is must for that reason. The other issue that was raised was regarding um, Savage Javit and the UK Government Home Office reporting um, when they claimed that there was, in their opinion, no zones, no national zones needed, nor will be implemented. But um, of course, we're not the same place as England with regard to this issue, nor Scotland, nor Wales. And I'm not aware that either Mr Javid or the Home Office paid any consideration at all to the women in Northern Ireland when reporting back that there was no need for national zones. But CEDA have. And under their UK inquiry, they identified the difference between Northern Ireland and GB and they recommended safe zones as a solution. And when these have been put in place in England, it has been under council authority and council remit. But of course, councils in Northern Ireland have very, very different powers to those in GB. So we are a Northern Ireland Assembly. And this Assembly, we are tasked with creating Northern Ireland specific legislation. And that's what this bill is. And I also want to acknowledge um, Liz Kimmins' contribution too, when she rightly thanked her local constituents when they came together and formed themselves into a group supporting women Yuri in direct response to the ongoing protests on the streets. But they shouldn't have to. 
And we need to be very cognizant to this level of response and any unintended consequences coming from that. We are tasked with creating solutions rather than creating none and allowing people to come up with their own. I suppose in summing up, I just want to thank again every member for acknowledging the deliberate campaign of harassment and intimidation being allowed to continue in our streets, even those who are not supportive of the bill. I think it's really, really heartening that that has been acknowledged. I thank the members from Sinn Féin, SDLP, UUP, Alliance Party, People Before Profit, Claire Sugden and Trevor Lunn, who I know is not in the debate but has, uh, has sent support for the bill, for all your support at this stage, and also to the Health Committee for agreeing to receive the bill for scrutiny, if passed today. And I look forward to, if that happens, working with you through that process and commend the bill. Thank you, Speaker. Members of the question. Order members, Clark, please read the result. 87 members voted, 58 members voted aye, 29 members voted no. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. Unfasten the doors. Ask members to take their ease before the next item of business.